And here we are live. For our chat. Our Lord chat. We've popped out. And we have this. We'll go to a live chat because we always prefer that to the top chat. And we'll do this. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? Sorry, running about two minutes late, but you always have to argue about split a little bit. I think it's the kind of thing it does now. If you don't argue with it, it doesn't feel loved or something in terms of XSplit. It's, it's one of those lovely systems. Right then, so I have been playing around with the microphone settings, so hopefully they're all working fine. And that's the empty bottle of iron brew, which is supposed to turn it in. And as you can see, I have got an appropriate t-shirt for looking at the Crown Colony class because, well, I couldn't find a Crown Colony class t-shirt, but I do have an HMS Belfast t-shirt. That is the one good, that is the other good thing here. I can actually stand up. So at some point I might get a full projector screen, mount a projector up there and do a full presentation a la that style. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. <sighs> right then, so let us move this to there. Make sure I've got them out. Uh, that's some iron brew. And let's see who we've got live with us today. Who have we got chat on the chat? Because hello to everyone who's not on the chat. Hello. I can understand you not joining the chat. It does talk a lot about the Blackburn Blackburn. So if you don't want to join the chat, I, I, I get it. I do, I do understand it. Hello, Dan Freeman. It's good to have an admin in this evening. So it's make my life a little bit easier. Thank you. Uh, Peter Dawson, hello. Carl Gaswood, hello. Anuk, hello. Rick Vasawa, hello. John Shea, hello. Alistair Crow, hello. Good morning from Western Australia. Good morning to Western Australia. Uh, Peter Dawson, excuse me. Do you know anything about a Perth? The ship or the Sizzy? <laughs> Anna John Shea, don't forget, I don't know if I should be worried or downright scared that the same person, e.g., you, who made, uh, who made the no modern politics on live at all, is also giving the blessings of the Blackburn Blackburn. Mm. <laughs> Dan Freeman, I, 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 refer to, I prefer to direct attention towards the contentious areas of made-up cults and ugly interwar aircraft. Uh, or should that be made up cults about ugly interwar aircraft? Modern politics tend to create strong feelings that hinder entertainment. They do, and hinder education as well. Hmm. <laughs> ah. Hello, Ian Carr. Hello. Ooh, there's an interesting track going on there. Hello, DGV40. Hello, Mithasaya Slavic. Hello, Shane F. Hello, Nautic Wolf. Hello, Wesley Phillips. Hello, Derp Squad. Hello, Aviator Enterprise. Hello, DV28L. I don't think I've seen you before, so hello. And hello, Bea Lenora. Hello, I have some Scottish tablet. Alas, no iron brew to go with it, just whiskey. Mm, I'll, I'll accept whiskey on the grounds that, you know, occasionally Drac NFL does switch between the two. I don't, but he does. That's good. Next split marketing strategy. The longer people use it for free, the more irritating bugs are introduced. Trust me, I've been using it for free now for over a year. So, well, no, all, it must be coming up to a year. Yeah, it must have been March last year. Must have been. I sort of started this, didn't I? March or was it May? I have no idea. Oh, good lord, that's going to be an interesting one. How long have I been using XSplit for? Actually, because I didn't start off with XSplit, did I? I started off with another program, which was terrible. 
and then Drac made me change to expert under way uh, under fear of him coming and installing it himself. <laughs> good evening, JLF. Gilling in 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 car. Tom Golding. Good evening. Hello, silly manicots. Hello, Force One. Hello, Alistair Shaw. Hello, Sub the Student Aviator. Hello. Hello, Jason Miner. Hello. We've got a whole load of new people in here. It's nice this evening. Hello, Stafford Thompson. How are you doing? Already loaded three and a half thousand pounds of metals and around 700 pounds of glass today. Soft hands. Tent and knees. Good luck. Hello, dear. Uh, hello, Dean Carpenter. I don't think I said hello to you yet, this evening. Hello, Kana Schnimbeck. Hello. Probably mispronounced that one. Hello, Sal Murkiello. Hello! Long time, uh, long time no chat. Sal, good to have you here. You're going to enjoy tonight's one. There's going to be a lot of engineering. And hello, Aviator Enterprise. Again, March last year, world shutdown. Yeah, Chris Housley. Bizarrely, outside the UK, scotch is easy to get than Iron Brew. I can understand that. I can understand that. There are more people who drink alcohol than drink Iron Brew. That's for sure. Lockdown started March 26th. Oof. Stuff something. I believe your birth. I think your birthday is the anniversary. No, I think my birthday is a little bit before the anniversary, actually. Considering my birthday is in roughly two weeks' time. Catron, there is something worse than expert. There is. Hello, Richard Kirk. My poodle say hi to your FRI. Well, my fluffy research assistant would be in here saying hi at the moment. But he's currently inside providing a, a, a impromptu a version of a, a poodle blanket to my mum because she's decided that she can turn the heating down. Thank God for large dogs and possibly the heating we turned up again in a bit. So that's awesome. Metals are 45 to 60 pound boxes. Glass are in sheets. So yeah, using gloves. <whistles> Same here, March 17th for mine. March is a good month to be born in. Jemma, it has to be around March because I became a mod in May and you had been doing this for a while before I got there. So it must have been around March. Good Lord. <sighs> that is a long time to think about. Anyway. Today's topic, and make sure I'm in the right <laughs> position, is the Crown Colony class. And they're rather cool. It took me a while to get to them, but honestly, there is a reason for this. And there is a reason they are chosen. It, you might have noticed the lives which have become long patrols tend to happen earlier in the month. And there is a reason for this, because they tend to uh, I tend to want to do a video talking about the comments on them. And I know I will get round to a video talking about the comments on the on the um, on the Royal Navy in the 1980s after I posted the final. Finally, got the slides to work. I went through it. The 1980s slide is still was still a bit weird, but it works now. I made some more changes, so now it will work. Hmm. So, uh, so Karen, speaking of the metals, but cranking out some nickel tons tonight, so I won't be able to stay long. Gotta go look after those furnaces soon. Oof, good luck. Hello, Melee Sigdo 40. You're driving again. That worries me in some ways. But I, I have faith in you, Manly. I have faith. Right then. So, in 1936, what is going on in the world? Because this is going to be a big year, even though. They do not start building till 1938, and they're really ordered in 1937. 1936 is the big background year for these cruisers. Unlike the Royal Navy now, when you talk about ship procurement, you're talking about background decades. In the interwar years, because they are literally churning out so many ships, it's a background year in many respects. If you consider it, it'd be the modern equivalent would be if the Royal Navy didn't just build the Type 23, they then started building the Type 24, then built the Type 25. Now we're starting the Type 26 and doing the Type, uh, considering doing Type 27, 
and you know all that sort of thing so that that's the kind of session you're talking about that there's a constant run of this design is not just iterated iterated it is there is a functioning version put into the production you don't of course have that today. so what's going on in 1936 and there is a lot of weird stuff going on but not necessarily, but you've gone live so i've had to get on the phone cool just be safe while driving, okay? Be safe. Michael Rose. Hello, Michael. Evening all. Finally able to catch up with live streams again after the many shifts selling Iron Brew in the local co-op. Good luck. I hope you sold lots of it. Also, started playing as a lane. Disappointed that Renown doesn't have a skill to go berserk if Glowworm sinks. That would be appropriate, because she did. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Austin, nice now basically going, uh, yes, in paper we can take you. In practice, you look annoyed. And P I W -S, S E D O F F. So, um, yeah, we're going to be that way. Fast. Hello, Jack Hunter. So, what happens in 1936 in Europe? Well, you've got King George V dying. That's rather annoying because he's quite a decent monarch especially when it comes to the navy there is the classic uh I, 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 there is one classic tale that the reason hms eagle doesn't end up as this amazing thing with tons and tons of torpedoes on it as well as an aircraft or some nighttown torpedo cruiser as well as an aircraft carrier is because king george v says to the prime minister that well that sounds like a rather stupid idea and when a king sells you, the idea is rather stupid. <laughs> this is the thing. Uh, people often forget about monarchy, and uh, this is one of the love things. Is they, the more they've lost formal power, the more they've gained in the formal power. In that they're the one person the Prime Minister has a weekly chat with, who the Prime Minister has to tell legally, has to tell everything to. And who can turn around to the Prime Minister and go, that's a stupid idea, isn't it? Because their position doesn't depend on the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister's position doesn't depend on the monarch. That is a unique thing. It's a facility which you do not have in any other system of government. I'm not saying it's the, the be-all and end-all and it's the reason to keep everything. Although I, I'm actually pro-monarchy, but leave that to one side. It's a unique thing, which is actually quite a cool idea. You know, you have someone who the, the elected leader of the country can go to and go, these are my plans. And they can go, well, I'm not going to trust me not to tell them to anyone else. But that is bloody that is stupid. <laughs> it works. Unfortunately, that means Edward VII. We'll get on to him in a bit. Uh, we have the fourth Winter Olympics in Germany which never gets as much attention as the Summer Olympics, but the, use, uh, the lovely leader of Germany in the 1930s, who if I say the name of YouTube, will immediately start having panic attacks over, so I'm not going to say his name, um, takes full advantage of them. And swiftly after them, thanks to all that national popular opinion, then reoccupies the Rhineland. And everyone's going, oh, well, it's technically part of their country and technically they should be able to have troops in their own country. Yeah, so we're not going to do anything about it. That's what, Here's the thing. If France alone had, had done something when Germany reoccupied the Rhineland, the, probably the whole thing would have stopped. It's the whole thing when you're dealing with dictatorships. If you look back and you look at the small things, they take the small jumps at the beginning, because they always do a small one. If you reacted then, instead of going, uh, I'm going to send a sternly worded note, they would have run back because they're basically bullies. Most dictatorships are. But once they take a small one, then take a big one, and a big one, and a big one. And eventually you end up with a world war, whether you wanted one or not. Because, of course, you did all this thing of kept giving in because you were hoping to avoid a world war. Because, of course, giving in is how you avoid a world war. Because World War I started because no one gave in. So World War II, they tried to avoid it, World War II, uh, by giving in. And then that didn't work. So now we're left in the quandary of how do you avoid a world war? 
and you have the Cold War experience, where you did actually have a world war, which was getting hot in various places in Asia and Africa and South America, but wasn't importantly in Europe for once, uh, much, um, because of the threat of nuclear weapons. So, you know, deterrence, that's how you avoid a world war. But now we have countries doing what they're doing, and everyone's in it going, uh, because it's a quandary. Anyway. This is what we have in terms of the Crown Colonies. Uh, Jeff Hill, after all, will Matrix Uganda, uh, will HMCS Uganda, which voted itself out of war, be covered? Yes. <laughs> Jeff Hill, the class in which the RN rediscovered the Transom Stern, although modestly compared to the USN. Hmm. Do you say rediscovered? I say finally decided it was worthwhile doing. Uh, Mike Rose, evening will finally able to catch live stream. Ooh, da -da 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 -da. I think I've seen one. And Alice the Shore, who do you convince when an absolute monarch won't change his mind? His wife. Well, their spouse probably is quite true because there have been a fair number of absolute monarchs who weren't. I, I'm thinking uh, there was a certain Catherine the Great in Russia. And a, 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 a few Egyptian ones, and a few Chinese ones as well. Mm. Edward the Eighth, not Edward the Seventh. Did I type in Edward the Seventh? Oh, Edward the Eighth. Yes. Sorry. But literally, he only appears on this one slide, and frankly, I don't care that much about him. Uh, Kedron. Also, according to the chieftain, the French had only really planned to invade Jenny wholesale, but didn't have any plans for anything smaller. Yeah, that's the trouble. Actually, even if they just mobilized, the Germans would probably have withdrawn. So you didn't need to, need to do an invasion. You just needed to mobilize your army and go, go. You don't actually need to do anything. Dan Riemann, I think the best bet for avoiding World War was pa the Pax Britannica of 1815 to 1914, which was fine so long as you weren't somewhere Britain wanted to put a flag. Eh, yeah. Hello, Shumi. Shumak. Ah, yeah, that's the problem with French pre-war doctrine. Didn't they, ha didn't, they didn't have real professional formations, but they were the cadres for the reserves. Eh, to an extent. Dan's not with all weird stuff. The Spanish Civil War erupts. Then the Olymp Summer Olympics are held in Germany. Yes, and this time the Olympics tended to be held uh, sometimes, and often actually were, held in the same country if they had the facilities for both the Winter and the Summer Olympics, which is kind of weird. Um, and then there is the Edward VIII abdication crisis, which Ireland uses to break further away from Britain. Causes more fun. Man, it's My I rushed inside. Stream was playing just fine with the screen off. When I plugged the phone in, it was when it decided, right, we've got mains power. Time to shut off due to lack of sufficient power. <laughs> oh, phones. Right then. In the Far East, what's going on there? Well, there's the February the 26th incident in Japan, which only ends when Emperor Hirohito pretty much threatens to execute his army high command. And he does this by a very interesting method. He basically, the army high command are going, no, 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 these people, we don't want to do anything about them, we don't want anything. And he says, Ryan, I will go to a radio station myself and broadcast myself as the emperor and say, I disavow of this. And anyone, and I support it. Well, that would, of course, cause the soldiers to all turn on the generals and could let all the generals who have been tacitly supporting this attempted coup, which had attempted to capture and imprison Hirohito, as well as killing off many of his senior ministers, including one senior minister's brother, uh, a brother in law, because they look the same. So they got the wrong brother in law. I don't know. Um, that's going on. There's the anti comintern Pact signed between Germany and Japan. That's lovely. The Xi'an incident. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China is uh, kidnapped by Marshal Xiang Zuhil. Um, fun. And there's the West China famine, which leaves an estimated 5 million dead. This is what's going on in the world. I've got the Spanish Civil War as well. Cute. 
Rest of the world, so what's going on in Africa, basically, in Russia? Italy annexes Ethiopia and turn forms from the remainder of their colonies Italian East Africa. Brilliant. And then Joseph Stalin begins his great purge. So this is 1936 in quick. And let's go on. This is a year when there will be a naval treaty signed. Yes, because with all this going on, there are politicians in the world who think, you know what we need to do to solve all these problems? Disarm! Drac has this great point he made in, I think it was the podcast which came out last week, episode 39. And he's, or oh, maybe it was 37. But anyway, in one of them, he says that the trouble is when you're a politician and you have your mind fixed on disarmament, you presume everyone else must be doing the same as you, no matter how much evidence to the contrary you can see. And 1936 is a classic example of this. So here's the thing. That's what's going on. And before we get on to town class, let's answer some quick, quick questions that come in. Um, Gajan, how many animals were on the target list? Not as many as you'd think for an army versus na uh, uh, for uh, imperial, uh, 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 the Imperial Japan era. For some reason, they were actually not after as many admirals as you'd think. There were a couple on the list, but not so many as you'd presume. Um, but remember, guys, nobody had political agency in pre-war Japan. It was all the US fault that the war happened. The fact is... Mm, there's all sorts of issues We're in Japan in the 1930s. <clears throat> that was good. Cool. ABA was probably given a, a choice between abdication and unfortunate, but very fast, slip in the bathroom. No. Not even that. It was simple put, he couldn't marry the woman he wanted to because she'd been divorced and be head of England, Church of England. At that time, that was pretty much against the law. So, not just, and when I say pretty much against the law, I mean, technically, possibly could get away with it, but the monarchy couldn't have because of the way the national was. So it's against the law in terms of the moral and cultural imperative at the time. Remember, this is a very different time than we have today. And also, I don't think Edward VIII really wanted to be king. He liked being Prince of Wales. I wouldn't be surprised if Prince Charles finds it however he becomes king as well. He likes being Prince of Wales. You have a lot of fun being Prince of Wales, but it's like being the second in command of a warship. Yes, you've got a certain amount of pressure. Yes, you have a busy job. Yes, you have a lot of commitments. But ultimately, the buck doesn't stop with you. If there's a problem, it doesn't stop with you. You don't have to take the fall. You don't have to, you know, you're not the one who's responsible. That's the king. That's the captain or the queen or whatever. That, that's the, the reality of being Prince of Wales. And I just don't think he wanted to be. He wanted the pressure. So what's the Royal Navy building in 1936? Voila, the town class. And Dido's as well, but we'll leave that to one side. The town class are the big thing the Royal Navy's building, and the Royal Navy wants lots of them. The Royal Navy really does want lots of them, and that's one of the reasons why the previous negotiations for treaty uh, for a naval treaty broke down. Politicians have decided that in 1936 one, we're going to get rid of all the naval experts because they just get in the way. Well, one of the reasons why was the Royal Navy wanted lots of these. They really did. Dan Freeman, town class. Hello, gorgeous. Hmm. Alt and that's the crowd. Alternative history. King George V never takes up smoking and doesn't fall forever. Different 1930s occurs. Very interesting different 1930s. Um, 
Man, it's incredible. To be fair, last I charged it was on the set on the second, and then only twenty percent left the house like five and a half hours ago with only fifty percent battery. I'd phone you. I'd say your phone did pretty decently as well, Melanie. It's financial intelligent. It wasn't the US fault. It is the Russian. It was the US for all. The US fault is the Russian line, often advanced covertly. It's literally Russian propaganda. Eh, actually, no. It's usually people who try and take away agency from anyone who's uh, for various reasons. Uh, Peter Dawson, King George V's illustrious class ruled in 1936, but illustrious and sisters were laid down early in 1937. Yep. Understand. Every chief of state is under enormous British pressures. I feel bad for the monarchs. Yeah. Brent Paulus. Hello, Brent. How far back does development of the town and crown colony guns go? Quite a long way, because you must remember, and I, this is what I could do with this shirt. This is one of the reasons why I wore this shirt. Right. So, it's all about getting this gun into service. Yeah. The treble six. Ah, see? I can use my t-shirt as a teaching tool. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> um, the treble six is what the Royal Navy is really, really worried, concentrating on. Mm, all right, Dev Scott. There's apparently evidence that Wallace Simpson was put in the position to woo the king. <sighs> There's all sorts of stuff about that. No, and that's okay. And Dido should be on a T-shirt, mm, possibly. Evening Rowan Cash. Sure, I see some people say Roosevelt should have uh, just caved and that Chamberlain was a, was a moron for doing appeasement. This makes a lot more sense if you view it as a Soviet propaganda. Yeah, basically, they're, they're, none of them want a war, and they're not sure how to not have a war. And that's their problem. Rowan Cash, love to have seen a town class chew up and spit out a pocket battleship. Honestly, if a couple of town classes had bumped into a pocket battleship, there wouldn't have been a pocket battleship left, the amount of firepower they'd have shot at them. There's, they do enough damage to Sharnhorst. Remember, it's Belfast, if I remember correctly, who takes out Sharnhorst's radar and direction finding gear in the Battle of North Cape. All right. Do you know what? Hey, you can use your nipple as a teaching tool to on that. No, I can't. Right then. Hello, Melanie, sitting forty. Right. Why is your joke unallowed? What happened? Hello, Casper Fung. Right then. So, here is the lovely core things of the 1936 London Naval Treaty and what matters for warships and cruisers. And this is probably going to explain a lot. Article one. For the purposes of the present treaty, the following expressions are to be understood in the sense of hereafter defined. A. Standard spaceman. The standard spaceman of a surface vessel is a displacement of the vessel, complete, fully manned, engined and equipped, ready for sea, including all armament and ammunition, equipment, outfit, provisions, and fresh water for crew, miscellaneous stores and implements of every description that are intended to be carried in war, without fuel or reserve feed water on board. Hello, water is armor. The standard displacement of a submarine is the surface displacement of the vessel, complete, exclusive water in the non watertight structure, fully manned, engined and equipped, ready for sea, including all armaments, ammunition, equipment, outfit, provisions for crew, miscellaneous stores, and implements of every description that are intended to be carried in war without fuel, lubricating oil, fresh water, or ballast water of any kind on board. The word ton, except in the expression of metric tons, denotes the ton of 2,240 pounds, or 1,016 kilos. B, categories. Three, and this is, I, I skipped battleships and carriers for obvious reasons. Uh, three, light surface vessels. Are surface vessels of war other than aircraft carriers, minor war vessels, or auxiliary vessels, basically anything that's not a battleship, the standard displacement of which exceeds 100 tons and does not exceed 10,000 tons, and which do not carry a gun with a calibre exceeding 8 inches, or 203 millimetres. The category of light service vessels is divided into three subcategories as fossil, uh, follows. Vessels which carry a gun with a calibre exceeding 6.1 inches, 
Vessels which do not carry a gun with a calibre exceeding 6.1 inches, and the standard displacement of which exceeds 3,000 tonnes. Vessels which do not carry a gun with a calibre exceeding 6.1 inch, and the standard displacement of which does not exceed 3,000 tonnes. Dot dot to Article 6. No light surface vessel of subcategory B exceeding 8,000 tonnes, standard metro displacement, and no light surface vessel of subcategory A shall be laid down or acquired prior to 1st January 1943. Notwithstanding the provisions of paragraph 1 above, if the requirement of the national security of any high contracting party are, in his opinion, please note, yeah, it's there, that's their phraseology, not mine, materially affected by the actual or authorised amount of construction by any power of light vessel, surface vessels of subcategory B, or of light surface vessels not conforming to restrictions of paragraph 1 above, such high contracting parties shall, upon notifying the other high contracting parties of his intentions and the reasons therefore, have the right to lay down or acquire light surface vessels of subcategories A and B of any standard displacement up to 10,000 tonnes. <coughs> Subject to the observance of the provisions of Part 3 of the present treaty. Each of the other high contracting parties shall thereupon be entitled to exercise the same right. It is understood that the provisions of Paragraph 1 above constitute no undertaking expressed or implied to continue restrictions therein prescribed after year 1942. So... Basically, you have six years of treaty restriction on building as long as no one else does anything that worries you. And notice it takes down the cruiser. You basically, you're not allowed to build heavy cruisers and you're not about to build those super light cruisers which Britain's been building so many of. You've got to take it down to 8,000 tons. Hmm. Felix B. Hello, not from a crown or a co or of a colony. Hmm. Tom Colin. Ironically, the collapse of the Anglo-Japanese resilience as a result of Washington Treaty may have actually caused the wars in Asia uh, by Japan's pretty violent segue into a full-on Showa statism. He, uh, I would argue they're heading there in a way, in a way, a bit, uh, in a way anyway. Do you know what I'm on? Hello, water-based armor. Admiral King begins to move his grave. It works! Uh, Ian Carl, No mention of Transcend Sturm in articles. No. Town class upon seeing a Deutschland. There's, there's a nice superstructure you have there. It would be a shame if someone was to Swiss cheese it with six-inch guns. Probably. Um. Right. Ah, <laughs> oh, let's see. Also, tank class, let's see if we can't poke some holes in that heavy armor of yours. Probably. Manage six forward. High contracting parties. Right then. So, there are high contracting parties and low contracting parties. High contracting parties are really the big three. Um, Britain, America, and Japan. Then there are all sorts of countries. I, Italy, Germany, sort of not included, but sort of referenced in it. Uh, France, uh, who are... In it, but they're low contracting powers in that they really aren't involved in it as much as the others because they don't have that big of navies. And it is a this sort of illegal term for states, as financial insider says. Sure, Mike, you have to take it down to 8,000 tons on paper. Well, we'll be talking about that in a second. And financial intelligence have put in some very interesting points here. It's the idea that they are all ultimately equal powers, ultimate in, uh, on their own territory, equally international, hence the term high contracting. Contracting becomes, as in some languages, treaty and contract are the same word, e.g. Joan. And because their legal obligations to each other are positive, not natural. Ancillary power isn't an international law term, though ancillary is a legal term. Uh, there are minor powers. Legally, though, all states are sovereign until authority on their own territory. Hmm. I should look up the treaty text. It's a fun treaty to look up. 
All right. It is a fun treaty, but as you can see, there are a few problems in this if you're thinking, let's go back to, this is going on in the world, and yet we are going, we'll go through this. The world, our plan. <sighs> Basically, everyone's invited to be involved in car. Some people choose not to be involved, but they're involved anyway, because you cannot build, the high contracting powers are most of the people who can actually build the things, and they're not building them for anyone else if they don't fit the treaties. Some are kind of, did the town class feel less of a cruiser since the US Navy's Brooklyn's and Japanese Marines had 15 six-inch guns and the town's only 12? <laughs> no, actually, they really didn't. Uh, it's one of the things in that the towns, when they showed up, sort of went, yeah, but you look cramped. We have space to be cruisers in peacetime. And then in wartime, we can take you out. So, here is the debate that comes after the treaty. So, Mr. Churchill asked the Prime Minister whether his statement on the 11th of March, 1935, upon the subject of the escalator clause, as applied to British cruiser tonnage, still holds good. The Prime Minister, the statement referred to by the Right Honourable Gentleman was part of a speech on the general question of defence and was not intended to be an exhaustive or final declaration of our position in regard to London Naval Treaty limits. In particular, the use of the words like cruisers may have caused some misapprehension. The reference was to a type of vessel which are classified by the French as destroyer leaders and up to 18 months ago were generally referred to as such, which are now classified as cruisers in the United Kingdom's publication type of fleets. The right honourable gentleman is aware we believe we have a clear case for increasing the destroyer tonnage allocated to us under the London Naval Treaty, and we are already in negotiations on the subject with the foreign governments concerned. The right on gentleman will also observe that I was careful not to state on the 11th of March of last year that we consider that we had the right to increase in cruiser tonnage. Subject to this supplementary explanation, my statement on the 11th of March 1935 holds good. Which is Prime Minister term for, yes, I did say that, but. I didn't think I'd actually be called on it, and I didn't realise the world was going to go to pot this fast, and now I might actually have to do something about it, but I don't want to, because I don't want there to be a war, so... Uh, uh, uh. Mr. Alexander, has not the Right Honourable Gentleman's Government already announced that they have a programme of 70 cruisers in substitution for 50, including 10 overage cruisers? Why do they intend to scrap existing cruisers and waste money instead of keeping them? The Prime Minister, that matter can be, and of course will be debated, on the report stage of the Navy vote. Again, the Prime Minister going, I'm not going to answer that. I don't want to get into this card. Mr. Churchill asked the Minister for Coordination for Defence, what is the authoritative tribunal for settling whether the legal construction of the 1931 London Naval Treaty makes it necessary for Great Britain to destroy five serviceable cruisers before the end of the present calendar year? Minister for Coordination of Defence, Sir Thomas Inderskip, the gentleman whose report would allow the Royal Navy to get back control of the fleet air arm, there is no tribunal for deciding whether a party to part three of the London Naval Treaty is entitled to have recourse to Article 21 for the purpose of increasing its tonnage beyond limits fixed by the treaty. This is left to the judgment and good faith of the government's concern. Mr. Churchill, who then advises the government as to exactly within what limits their good faith lies in the proper interpretation of the treaty? Sir Thomas Inskip, on purely legal questions, the government have the advantage of the advice of the law officers of the Crown. Mr. Churchill, is not this a question par excellence for the right honourable gentleman be able to give them advice? Sir Thomas Inskip, if my advice is worth anything, it is always at the disposal of the government. We can all see what's going on here. It's not a very nice time to be government. You've got a lot of problems. You promised 70 cruisers, you've now got an issue coming up. And the question is, can you build enough? Can you do enough? Can I, can I PayPal you $75 for your book? Uh, there you uh, It's available. It's going to be available on Amazon. 
it's going to be fine. Um, if you want copies of them with me signing them, I'm going to arrange that after I get sent a box of them that I can send out, and then I'm going to sort it out because me and Drac are. Well, I've got an idea for what to do with that with Drac possibly because <clears throat> he has more. He has more experience of sending stuff out to people than I do. Um. Dandrine, would the Crown Colony class cruisers have been lighter if they had not included escalators but just used stairs? <laughs> In car, PM Stanley Baldwin, 1935. Yes, he's having fun. Jeffy, did the Crown Colony class work better with four main gun turrets or three? Uh, mostly they ended up with three when they were changing them to have more AA. And when they're adding on more 40mm and other stuff like that. Super chat. Mm, possibly. Hello, Furrykin. Lurking whilst cooking. So, basically, you can see Churchill is actually asking the government to state in a quiet way how much they can lie. So, my point is here. And I'm going to be getting into this when we get to the, town, uh, the Crown Colonies. Mm, there is some very interesting maths which goes on with them. So, some of you will recognize parts of this because parts of this come from the town class. And might be the reason why the town class hasn't gone, li hasn't gone live on pa the Patreon yet, the, pit of the slides, but they are going up there soon. So, the stats. This is Southampton, Gloucesters, Edinburghs, Fijis, and so on. So I'm basically treating the three cl the classes as if they are, rather than three subclasses of one class and two subclasses of a second class, as in they are a continuation of design. And in many ways, they are. So, length, 555 feet, 6 inches. So they've gone down 36 feet from a Southampton or a Gloucester. Okay. Beam, 62 feet. Well, they're narrower than a Gloucester, but they're fatter by the same amount than a Southampton. So they split bang in the middle of a Southampton and Gloucester in terms of beam. Draft, 16 foot, 6 inches. Well, their draft is a lot shallower. They've gone down four foot one inch. Well, how do I put this? Four foot one inch on a Gloucester. Eh, three foot ten inches on a Southampton. Let's look at their power. Four free drum boilers. Four free drum boilers. Okay, driving four Parsons geared turbines. Wow, that sounds about the same. Developing 72,000, 72,500 sh shaft horsepower over four shafts for a top speed of 31.5 knots or 10,000 nautical miles at 12 knots. Okay, so they've got 2,500 less shaft horsepower than a Southampton. But the Salons have got 80,000 shaft horsepower, and their top speed is technically 32 knots officially, but that means they have the same shaft horsepower as the Edinburgh's, and only 2,500 less than the Gloucester's. 10,000 nautical miles at 12 knots, 10,000 nautical miles at 12 knots. Okay. Main belt. Three and a half inches, well, three and a quarter inches, three and a half inches over near magazines. That's gone down from Southampton's, which is a four and a half inch main belt. Um, magazines are, have also got two and a half, two inches over them and other them, and it's on there are four and aft. So basically, they've got two inch box and then they connect to the, so they've got three and a half inch on the belt and outside them. 
Um, that's two to three inches. And gun turrets were two, uh, one to two inches. So turrets are broadly the same, although they are a, modern, a modified version of the turrets in Edinburgh rather than those in the Gloucesters or Southamptons. And you have 12 six-inch guns in the Fijis, nine in the Salons, eight four-inch guns in the Fijis, eight in the Salons, eight, eight well, in two quad mountings, pom-poms in the Fijis, 12 in the Salons, in three quads. Uh, both have triple torpedo tubes. Both are theoretically fitted for two, uh, two walrus, but never, uh, and it's never fitted on Fiji or Kenya, and it's all removed from mostly from 1944. Although there's one which might have into January 1945. Wikipedia is very positive on it, but everyone else, uh, other sources aren't. And their peacetime crew complement is roughly 730. Now, I can see what some people are saying already to refer this. Um, Tusk squad, does it state how much you can lie under the entire point of lie? Uh, stating how much I'm lying in the first place? Not really. It's saying that, you know, it's basically he was asking the government to say they weren't going to lie, in which case they've got cover. Because they can always say, well, in the House of Commons, we were, are we are not lying. Sure, Mac. By the way, I'm going to use the concept of a monarch regularly meeting with the PM and just saying it, 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 it's how it is for my RP. Oh, that sounds cool. That's true. If you aren't the government, yes. You know, I'll be honest. This is way better than what a college course will offer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the car, look, more plan area on towns than the current Carlton Colonies for AA editions. Um, actually, the towns and the current Colonies have pretty much the same level of additions. The trouble is, for the towns in getting them, is by the time, is, how do I put this? Uh, the towns go for a lot more of war because these are mostly in the service 1904, 1941, 1942. So by the time, the time they end the service, the towns already fought quite a lot of World War II. That's the thing. Screw Oh, from an earlier stream. The free sun turbine engine might have uh, made sense. Several ships at that time had a triple expansion uh, power recovery turbine set up on free shafts. Hmm. Sure. Are you implying that Lara literally took a town class design, rearranged the deck chairs, and said it's 8,000 times honest? I'm not saying that, but after all those stats, here is the thing. The Fijis are 10,725 tons full, the Salons are 10,840 tons full, yet apparently they are both roughly 8,000 tons in standard compared to the Southamptons, which are 9,100 tons in standard and 11,350 ton tons full. And the Gloucester's 9,400 tons standard and the 11,650 tons full. You sit there and go, um, excuse me. So you're honestly telling me that you're going to be adding roughly the same components onto this ship. And it's going to be 625 tons less when full. But it's a whopping eleven hundred tons less less in standard. Let's think about that. Apparently, a ship which has broadly the same crew, broadly the same amount of fuel, uh, broadly the same amount of everything, in a slightly smaller hull with slightly less armor. Yes, all those things, but. It dramatically takes on more to be full up than the other one does. Because you're saying the Southamptons take 2,250 tons to be full. You're, taking, you're saying the Fijis take 2,000 
725 tons. No, yeah. But, so I'm not saying they're lying because I, I haven't got the proof. I haven't been able to crawl all over a Fiji class or a Salon class. I'm just saying there is something interesting going on. And let's be honest, the Salon class, Salons should be even lighter. Because remember, they're replacing a whole turret. Yeah, a whole one of these with a pom-pom. A quad pom-pom, but a pom-pom. That's what's happening. Why the larger complement on Gloucesters? Uh, they could carry more Marines and they had some other birthing facilities. Why do you say peacetime complement is roughly 730? What, what, how would that change otherwise? Their wartime complement could be up to 1,000. Include, when they have all turrets manned and everything included there. They could have up to 1,000 on them. Down here, uh, the Gloucesters have slightly different engines, needing a slightly larger engine for room crew. Mm, a bit of that and a bit of other things going on as well. Uh, Down here, was there a cunning plan to reduce the birthing spaces by recruiting a shorter personnel for the Grand Calling Us? Nope. Uh, mm. Sure, that food is really heavy in particular ships. It's still unexplained by modern science. <laughs> and that comes to us. Come at war more as people, uh, more AA people, uh, more AA, more people, more redundancy, and you can't do reduced manning at any time. Yes, basically, in when you're in war operations, you need more people and. If you consider in some of the periods we're going to be talking about, they were basically running around with one tur only one turret manned in peacetime. They'd carry all the shells for all the turrets, but they'd basically be mothballed. Cleaned, maintained, but no, not fired. It's saved on crew costs and can take your crew down to as low as 650. Did the doctor ignore the tongue twister? Um, honestly, I didn't see it. Dumb downtown five times fast. Mm. No, no. I don't, wouldn't consider the Crown Colonies a dumb downtown for starters. Let's look at this one. You know, it, 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 there are lots of things. Uh, which are in here, which, well, how do I put it? No, not dumbed down. And at some point, I'm going to start on the next generation, which, of course, is the Minotaur or Swiss class, and lots of fun comes along with them. Come on, re food weight. When you cram in 22 Sea Kings instead of 8, but can only shower once per week. See Bill Trumps. Actually, no, 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 no. You have to remember, you had to draw a line around your body, and you could shower one half every other day, and you could use a flannel on Sundays to do other bits. And remember, those are Navy showers, so you have 
30 seconds under the spray, if you're lucky, 45 maybe. There is a reason why long showers are called Hollywood showers. I think in both the Royal Navy and the US Navy from experience. And of course, the Crown and the Colonies had a transom stern. That did improve certain things in terms of their performance, which does explain why they got 31 and a half knots. But it also, to me, doesn't explain why you add 7,500 shaft horsepower and yet claim your speed only goes up by half a knot. Think about that. Because... The Gloucesters add 7,500 shaft horsepower on the Southamptons, and they go from 32 knots up to 32 and a third knots, officially. And the Edinburghs have about a hull, a greater length to beam ratio, and they get 32 and a half knots from 80,000 shaft horsepower. And yet, 80,000 shaft horsepower on Salons, an increase of 7,500 shaft horsepower over the Fijis only gives them half a knot extra speed. Again, I'm not being suspicious, but it seems a little bit light to me. Take care, Claire, and yes, I will. The well, same to your FRAs, FRAs, your fluffy research assistants. Enjoy. Have a good time. Uh, Manly 64, it's split and polish era. We've got all these shiny guns, and boy, do we keep the shell shiny, but God forbid we fire them. Think of all the additional time that are required to clean. Uh, it was more, yes, the government definitely's mind was split in the Polish era. Jeff Beeler, how awkward was the X turret arrangement in reality? It was tight on the Fijis because the Fijis have, again, I've got a Belfast, a Belfast on me, and she's, of course, part of the Edinburgh Soviet Group, which have the largest of these turrets of any of the towns. They are actually the large town turrets. And the Fijis and Salons are technically smaller than the Southamptons, and yet they're fitted with the Edinburgh's turrets. So they have lots of space in the turret, which is great, but that means you cramp everywhere else outside the turret. Dan Truman, Royal Navy steer fires for the treaty. Oops, did we forget to put that engine in when we weighed the ship? Darn, and we just posted off the forms and everything. Yeah, it gets fun. So, BG Group, part one. This is HMS Fiji. Actually, it's a picture from 1940. Why is it a picture from 1940? Well, because HMS Fiji is laid down in March 1938, launched May 1939, commissioned May 1940, and is sunk May 1941. <sighs> I don't know. She took part. In the Battle of Crete, she took part, uh, she patrolled the Denmark Strait for Commerce Raiders. She managed to miss Admiral Sheeran's homeward, uh, homeward run, and then she was assigned to Force Age Gibraltar. Um, well, with Force Age, she then starts doing operations to relieve Malta, and takes part in various operations there and ends up in the Battle of Crete. Now, basically, she takes part in the escort, Force H's escort of Operation Tiger on a heavily convoy, uh, heavily laden convoy bound for Egypt. 
And Fiji, instead of going or turning the Force H, is seconded to the Mediterranean fleet. So she's one of the ships which goes the whole way with the convoy. So the convoy isn't just about getting the material ships, the supply ships through. It's about getting the older ships. Uh, it's getting some more ships through as well to the, to the Mediterranean fleet, which is running short of them. Now, British intelligence had anticipated the Germans would attack Crete on 17th of May. And Fiji was assigned to Force B with the town class cruiser Gloucester. And they had a patrolling west of the island. Their job was to rendezvous with the battleships War Spider and Valiant and their rest of their escorts. They rendezvoused successfully, and then the German air attacks began. Now, these had little of impact on them, actually, but they did exhaust their anti-aircraft ammunition. That afternoon, therefore, Cunning ordered the cruisers to disperse to their, into their original groups and search for any troop convoys in the Aegean. Germans spotted Force B shortly after the dawn on 22nd of May, as the cruisers were streaming south to rendezvous the battleships again. And while she was not damaged and directly hit during the attacks which followed, the near misses managed to knock out her anti-aircraft director. So she, now she's down to low ammunition. She's got an anti-aircraft director. Force B, which contained Fiji and Gloucester, as said, rendezvoused with Rear Admiral Rawlings and Force A1 and Force D under the command of Rear Admiral Irvin Glenvin at about 8.30am. Uh, and the combined forces reporting on their ammunition. At this point, Ajax is said to have 40% remaining, Orion 38%, Fiji 30%, Dido 25%, Gloucester 18%. Now, that means that Fiji and Gloucester are pretty much out of ammunition as far as air defense goes. This is a rather interesting discussion for the long war thing, which we're having in terms of build prompts at the moment, because this is the point. You're running out of ammunition. You, do not, you only have so much anti-air ammunition. At this point, Ajax, 40% ammunition. Orion, with 38% ammunition, and Dido, with 25% ammunition, are ordered to return to Alexandria with Glenny's, uh, with Irvin Glenny's Force D to rearm, but Gloucester and Fiji remained with Rawlings Force A1. And you sit there and go, well, why are they taking Ajax, Orion, and Dido home rather than Fiji and Gloucester? When Fiji and Gloucester have 30% and 18%, and the rest have more. Surely it should have been, if you're sending free cruisers home, you should have been sending home Fiji, Dido, and Gloucester, the ones with the free air with the lowest amount of ammunition left. Well, here's the problem. Barring Dido going home in that group, really your best anti-aircraft cruisers are Fiji and Gloucester. They've got a powerful anti air suite. They've got all these pom poms. They've got all these four inch guns. They've got directors. They've got large crews. They're stable platforms which can fire back. All these things are critical. If you send them home, you've got problems. So there is the reason. Unfortunately, this isn't that good for them. Because at 12.25 a.m., um, Force A1 received a request from Rear Admiral Edward Lee Stuart King to support HMS Need, a Dido-class cruiser, and the rest of Force C, which had been damaged. Force A1 heads east to the Kifra Chanel and rendezvousing with them between 1.30 and 2 o'clock. King took command of the combined force as the more senior admiral. Fiji and Gloucester, at this point, are detached from the group to provide anti-aircraft support for destroyers Kandahar and Kingston. Now, King would always say he didn't realise what rulings and decision rulings had made earlier. But if you're dispatching your force and sending them off to cover destroyers, 
it would probably be sensible, if they're going off alone, to check if they've got enough ammunition. Two destroyers had already been ordered to rescue the survivors of the destroyer Greyhound, which had been sunk at 1.50. At 2.13, King and Rawlings exchanged messages about the short of ammunition within both Force C and the Force A1, with Rawlings expressing concern about the orders given to Gloucester and Fiji. Following this communication, King issued an order to recall both Gloucester and Fiji at 2.47. So they'd been sailing away for 50 minutes by this point. Luftwaffe decided to focus their attention on the four dispatch ships dispatched to Greyhound. And they are under constant attack, and by this point, they're starting, they've exhausted their supply of four inch anti aircraft ammunition and are firing practice rounds. So is Gloucester. They're closing together, and at Gloucester was struck at 1 at 350 uh, by four bombs and was near missed by three others. Dr Fiji dropped life rafts but forced to bart the area with the two destroyers because of the, the state of fire coming in from the aircraft. These three ships then fought on and shot down one more attacker and severely had damage to others. And at 1900 hours, under heavy cloud cover, a Messerschmitt BF-109 struck the cruiser amidships with a bomb. Up, with a bomb. Now, this is one of the things I find kind of interesting, because they say it's a BF-109 fighter bomber, but uh, I'm not so sure about that one. The forward boiler and engine rooms are flooded, and she develops a severe list. Fiji manages to maintain a speed of 18 knots, though, until another BF-109 apparently hits it with another bomb that increased the list to 30 degrees. The abandoned ship was ordered in the face of the uncontrolled flooding and uh, was abandoned, and the capsized around 7.30. Her accompanying destroyers were unable to rescue any of the crew until after dark, when almost all of them were recovered safely. Sir Dudley Pound received a letter from Cunningham after this. The sending back of Gloucester and Fiji to Greyhound was another grave error and cost us those two ships. They are practically out of ammunition, but even had they been full up, I think they would have gone. The commanding officer of Fiji told me that the air cover, uh, the air over Gloucester, was black with planes. Following the loss of both Fiji and Gloucester air attacks, the anti-aircraft ammunition being exhausted, all British cruisers were given standing rules to not allow their anti-aircraft ammunition reserves to fall below 40%. In fact, if your ammunition fell below 40%, you could return home. Right. Take care, Nautical Wolf. Thanks for being here. Dan Freeman takes three years to build a ship, 300 to build a tradition. Takes three years to build a ship, 30 to build a crew, and 300 to build a tradition. Yep. Uh, good evening, Albert Zasky. Well, maybe look, I was thinking of uh, the rangefinder room on top of X turret, which disappears from the ship with the turret. Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, it stays, I think. Message from 18%. Could you cover those remaining ammunition figures again? And that ship, spe uh, that's specifically AA ammo. That is specifically AA ammo. And if I go over the figures again, um, Rawlings, and this is on to the 22nd of May at 8.30 a.m. They ha Ajax had 40%, Orion had 38%, Fiji 30%, Dido 25%, and Gloucester only 18%. And that point... There is not under the rulings of that comes out after the uh, after this incident. Not a single one of those cruisers should have stayed. See so one. How did Fiji compare to the Brooklyn's? Yes, boys, it hit a rock that caused her to miss Battle of San Jose. I was wondering about her massive six-inch battery effect on that in the last battle. It would have been interesting. The six-inch guns are fast-firing, well-manned six-inch crew can do a lot of damage. Jeff Wheeler, how's the need for more, uh, more light air handles? Systematically or ad hoc? Uh, it starts off as ad hoc, with basically captains telling chief petty officers, go find. Um, 
and XOs go find, and gunnery officers go find, and they did. At one point, the army is very upset because they stored all this Italian equipment that they weren't planning on using, but they captured from the Italians, and they go back there and they find all the guns disappeared. And Italian AA guns work really well when you match them with British naval radars. They really do. Um, so, that's what's going on, pretty much. So, anyway, how did Fiji... Oh, I've done that one. Um, <sighs> Costa Francis, couldn't you transfer AA ammo from the departing cruisers to them? Well, no, because the departing cruisers were still going to be under attack. So, they needed to keep some ammo for them. In car, why are our own ships carrying practice rounds on Metro in 1941? Well, you carry the practice rounds because you fire, you'll be firing every day anyway to keep up your practicing skill. So but just because you might have combat that day doesn't mean you don't practice. You practice every day. You might have combat in certain periods, but you won't have combat in others, so you're still carrying practice rounds. What was the list before the second attack and increase the degrees? It was 18 degrees list. Hello, Wanda. Hello, Yikus. What was you got? Capsized? Whew. It seems to take about 30 minutes to issue orders that will get a couple of very new well built ships to go to bomb. To go find a destroyer, which it covers some destroyers which we're getting. Uh, another destroyer's crew back. And that's the point. You can sort of see the reasoning going on here. It's going, right then, uh, we have to do this because this ship's been sunk. But it's the sort of thing which gets carrier damage, that gets a battleship damage, that gets all sorts of things damaged. Crete. Jeff Miller, is part of the problem that Fiji and Gloucester still had lots of main gun ammo? Yes, they still had lots of that. But, um, you know, that's useful if the Italians or the Germans, well, the Italians turn up. Uh, Darizuk Rosowski. The Colonel, the Navy saw our stuff again. Exactly. Actually, it caused some problems because they brought some of the stuff back to be some of the ships, then they got transferred home. Or well, they turned up in American yards. And they still had this Italian equipment aboard. And the Americans were going, that's not on the plans. That's not a British gun. Where did you get this? Oh, we got it off the attack of the army in North Africa. For what? <laughs> there are some of the tribal destroyers. It's just, you're sort of going, what the hell are you that? Excuse the French. And yeah, the whole thing is just a huge amount of firepower. And this is HMS Nigeria, which almost gets sunk and also has another special thing. Even if you could, I don't want to imagine how much things would screw up trying to transfer ammunition ammo between ships at sea. The time it would take to transfer the ammo would expose them to any danger. Mm, pretty much. <laughs> right then, so I'm going to restart in Nigeria so that she is definitely gets her full time. And Nigeria, well, interesting enough, we call this course the, sub the Fiji subclass, but she's laid down on the 8th of February 1938, is launched July 1939, and commissioned September 1940. But she's, of course, laid down first. So if she had actually been finished in order, I had managed to be launched and commissioned before Fiji, it would be the Nigeria subclass, or, you know, as she becomes Mysore. When she's in service with the uh, with the Indian Navy, um, in she enters service is commissioned in September nineteen forty. She starts off serving in home waters and does some time on the Scandinavian coast, basically blowing things up. And in company with the destroyers Bedouin, Tartar, and Jupiter, yes, that is two tribals coming along here. Intercepted the German weather ship Lahnberg in thick fog northeast of Jean Mayen Island. The German ship was detected through the use of HFDF, 
high frequency direction finding. And the crew of Lundberg abandoned ship after they were fired upon, allowing the British to board her and take the code books of the Enigma machine and all sorts of things that were found. Um, and it's one of the earlier captures of Enigma war material and came a few weeks after the destroyed Bulldog had, of course, captured its Enigma machine from Summary New 110. In July 1941, Nigeria became the flagship of Force K, commanded by Rear Admiral Philip Vian. During this period, Force K made two expeditions to Spitsburg, and that's Norwegian territory, first to ascertain the situation, the second in September to escort a troop ship, Empress of Australia, with Canadian troops and a team of demolition experts under Operation Gauntlet. Their task was to evacuate Norwegian and Soviet personnel from the archipelago and destroy coal mines and fuel stocks that might be of use to the enemy. Bear Island was also visited to destroy a German weather station. The two cruiser task force, Nigerian Aurora, diverted to intercept a German convoy during this time, and during this action, Nigeria sank the training, German training ship Brenz, but managed to damage her bow, possibly due to a mine, and so she sent to Newcastle for repairs. She then goes to the Mediterranean after she's been repaired, and she takes part in Operation Pedestal, well known for being a joyous thing for any ship. Uh, she was the flagship of the Close Escort Crew, under the commanded by Admiral Harold Burra. He's a fairly decent uh, admiral. Nigeria, unfortunately, is torpedoed and damaged by the Italian submarine Axum. As you know, Italian submarines are not that often heard from, but when they do, they do quite well. But managed to take, make it back to Gibraltar, escorted by three destroyers. So that was a really good shot for Axum, because if she'd sunk the, the cruiser, she'd have just taken and stripped the convoy of a cruiser. When you damage the cruiser, you strip it of three destroyers as well. And Admiral Burra, meanwhile, has to take command of the um, force from HMS Ashanti. Yes, that tribal class destroyer. And uh, so tribals keep turning up with Nigeria again, rather appropriately. She was, uh, Nigeria ends up being sent to the United States for repairs, which took nine months to complete. She then goes and operates off the South African coast while they're warming her up. And in 1943, picked up 30 survivors from the American merchant James B. Stevens. That was torpedoed and sunk by the German submarine U-160, about 150 miles northeast of Durban. Nigeria was then assigned to the Eastern Fleet from February 1944 until December 1945, when she returned to the UK to be refitted and she actually participated in raids on Sumatra during her time out there. Post-war, she serves with the Royal Navy, um, maintaining her four triple six-inch turrets until 1954, when X turret was finally removed. She was also sold then to India and went under reconstruction, um, largely on the same build, rebuild as Newfoundland plans incorporating some of the electronics and radar intended uh, by the Royal Australian Navy to be used as a refit of HMS Hobart, which had been abandoned. And in 57, she was recommissioned into the Indian Navy, who renamed her Mysore. During a time in the Indian Navy, she collided with the destroyer HMS Hoag, severely damaging Hoag's bow. Uh, Mysore was in service with, them, uh, with the Indian Navy for a further 28 years until she decommissioned on the 20th of August, 1985. And of course, HMS Hoag, was a battle class destroyer. So everything comes back to the tribals and the battles with Nigeria. She's a cute ship, but she does have an interesting life. Manly Sigma. And that's the one. And it's the tribals again. They tow uh, they towed in Greenland for prize money. <laughs> Never joke. They'd have tried. And let's see what nine USN cruisers were taken aside and made into aircraft carriers, sort of like battle carrier to reinforce fleet until Essex's came line. Did Iron Finger grabbing a few light cruiser hulls? Uh, they did, but they were actually building cruisers, uh, building their own carriers. And then by the time they were doing more, they actually had some light fleet carriers on the production. They had escort carriers, and they needed the cruisers for the cruiser rolls. This is the thing: the Royal Navy didn't have. In many ways, at the time, but also they didn't have the scenario where the Americans did, where they had so much of their fleet, a chunk of their fleet lost in one go. Marisovsky, you think the Americans of all people would accept extra guns? They found it confusing and amusing in equal rights, in equal lines. Uh, Dan Freeman, you try to nail something down to stop the iron sealing it, the iron go, ooh, good, nails as well as stuff to be acquired. Yeah. Uh, Darius Rosowski, Royal Navy tradition at its finest. Dares take everything and give nothing back. Hmm. 
Yeah, can't. What warships just received a nice sort of ship in the game? Cool. I'll have to play the game and see if I can play it. But I hope they add the Italian gun that she had in some of the or some parts of World War II. No, Look, spaghetti guns are quite effective at shooting down German aircraft. Stop quibbling about the spaghetti guns. <laughs> no, room. The risk of Nigeria being the class name for the Crown Colony class is if people pronounce it with a hard G. Mm. Pass me. Dan Hume, RNT US dockyards, with regards to Italian guns on the ships. Ah, uh, forget about it. We, we saw the fun you had with the Mafia during Prohibition and thought we would join in. Mm -hmm. uh, Calvin Gosford, uh, as it happens to be the same Navy which declared they do not want to serve those pirates, e.g. Summers. Remember, the Royal Navy is a broad church and it has a lot of opinions on it. And you do, you are talking about a period when the Royal Navy was at the end of the Victorian Navy period, which was not exactly the Royal Navy's high point in life. Um, Shomak, funny, what you just descri described was an RN ship engaging commerce raiding, but that doesn't make sense because the Navy said this was counter commerce raider. <gasps> my, my, my. So there is a sea change in determining combat capabilities. A previously an auxiliary function now becomes the prime function because you're going to use it more often than anything else. Pretty much. But when you do need the six inches, you really do need the six inches. It's, it's, the trouble is balancing two things because it's kind of like anti-ship missiles these days on ships, uh, on warships. Yes, you need them because when you need them, you really, really need them. But you need more air defense missiles because you're more likely to need them against aircraft. But that doesn't mean you don't carry anti-ship missiles because you're going to be in you're the cheapest, the quickest way and easiest way to get rid of an opponent who's firing their anti-ship missiles at you is to fire your anti-ship missiles at them if you don't have aircraft involved. So it's the same with the six-inch guns. You really need them because if you have an enemy surface combatant or you have a land target to engage or something like that. Do you need those six-inch guns? They're going to be critical. But you also really need the air defense now. The air defense has gone from being uh, something you have because you need it to deter the aircraft attack to being something you needed essentially to, uh, to take out the aircraft attack because you might not have enough carriers with you. Do you know what? My story is a premium ship. Ah, oh, I have to have a chat with them about that. Uh, Ninety-six forty. Speaking of submarines, I've got to risk a sidetrack and ask your thoughts and opinions on the K class. Uh, can we say that for another video? I will do that on another video. The K class. I will do a video on the K class at some point. I might even record it over the weekend. Not maybe not this weekend, but maybe next weekend. Remind. Send me a message on Discord and remind me of it. Pearl from Chicago. Didn't the RN cancel prize money model and after an account of it, uh, after an account of it not being fair? No. Darasky just finished Dragon Vels Wednesday into the video today. Poor guy got the COVID shot and it flattened him badly. He had to cobble together an episode that required a little letter than single possible. It has flattened him. Um uh we've been chatting i've been checking up on him uh he's he's okay i think now um we've got bill trumps tomorrow to record and i'm hoping he's going to be okay for that we've got a good guest coming but i'm going to try and keep it as painless and quick as possible hello del filipino the filipino May 1640 who at um j if you're on the discord I'm up the top on the list of the people. All I know is that's I, I, my name's at the top of the people on the server. That's usually what I go with. Right then. <sighs> Mauritius! Yes. Now, this is one of my favorites. I like number eight. I, I like C80, mainly because she's called C80, and I just think that's cool. Um, um, 
I'm actually, I have another picture which I almost use for her, but I'm going to put it up. But I didn't use it originally because, well, I just thought if I added, if I used it originally, it just doesn't give enough sort of picture. It's not enough of a, a description of her. Now, where do I save it? Ah, yes. There you go. There's her firing her six inch guns and, well, pretty much everything. Um, primarily fire, uh, uh, the firing her six inch guns during a night action in Alderin Bay between Brest and Lawrence and 23rd of August 1944. Uh, Mauritius was one of the first ones to, uh, ships to be completed with an internal degaussing system, which it managed to induce severe corrosion on the ship's uh, fire main, the copper fire main. This defect managed to render her unfit for action, required refits, first at Simon's Town and later at Singapore and finally at Plymouth. The future Admiral of the Fleet, Henry Leach, served as a midshipman aboard Mauritius uh, during this time. She eventually joins the Eastern Fleet in 1942, but was withdrawn in 1943 to reinforce the Mediterranean Fleet. Yes. We had to take ships from the Eastern Fleet to reinforce the Mediterranean Fleet because war, the war against Italy was going so interesting there. After affairs following grounding, she was operational in June 1943 and thereafter participated in landings in Sicily, Operation Husky, as part of support for Force East, where she carried out shore bombardment duties. In September, she took was part of the covering force for the Salerno landings. And then was transferred to the Bay of Biscay to stop blockade runners as part of Operation Stonewall. Why is it they always love the phrase Stonewall? Why is it it comes up again and again in history? Now, however, she soon returns to the Mediterranean proper, and this time takes part in Operation Shingle, the Anzio landings. In June 1944, she covered the landings in Normandy as part of Force D off Sword Beach then carried offensive patrols off the coast of Brittany to mop up the remnants of German ships in that area, and she, including sinking the Sparenbrecher uh, 157, a German auxiliary ship, during the Battle of Ordern Bay, also, uh, during, uh, during, and also during the Battle of Ordern Bay, sinks five, and I'm going to be trying to pronounce this, for Postenbutt, of Postenbutt, uh, which are basically German flagships, patrol boats, in one night. After this, she took part in, returned to the main carrier home fleet proper, took part in covering the carrier raids along the Norwegian coast and making any shipping strikes. And then in January 1945, with the cruiser Diadem, yes, that lovely Dido class light cruiser, uh, she fought uh, the action of the 20th of January with the German destroyers, in which Z31 was badly damaged. She was refit then refitted at Camel Lairds between February 1945 and, 40, and March 1946, before going to serve in the Mediterranean, where she takes part in the Corfu Channel incident in 1946. Then she returns to the UK in 1948, spent some time in reserve, recommissioned to go to the Mediterranean again. Uh, then goes into 1949, then goes and spends 1941-51 to 51 in the East Indies Station with 4th Cruiser Squadron before returning to Chatham in December 1951. She's placed in reserve in 1952 and remains there until 1965 when she's sold for scrapping. She is a cool ship and she has a good war. But she has a lot of damage at the beginning. And it's amazing the thing is that the gaussing does have that effect on the copper fire main. They have to start working out what they're going to do and how they're going to fix it. Yogi Khan, I checked. In World of Warships, Mosa has no extra telling guns. Oh, that's sad. People are all alternatively impressed or displeasing when I tell them of a submarine in service in 1918 that was capable of 24 knots on the surface. I've also left out a detail or two. Yes, they are, but it's fairly cool. Uh, K-class are cool, and I will do something on Model 1 submarines at some point. 
I said, I will do something on the K, a little bit of V on the K class if you want. If just remind me on in, um, on on Discord and I'll get onto it. Avian Empress, my father got the second round of the vaccine and it gave him flu like symptoms all weekend. I, when I had, as I've said before, I had my shot uh, because of my mum and sister being shielded and all the things they are, I had to get as well. They went out for, up for their vaccines from the local vaccine place and they actually got told off because I hadn't come because I didn't think I was supposed to. And they said, no, 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 he's supposed to be here. He's your carer. Okay, so I went up and I had mine. And I have to say, it knocked me out for about of a week. You can tell if you go back to the videos, you can work out which week it was because I was feeling tired and didn't really feel right for the entire week. I didn't get that bad of symptoms, but, you know, that got worse, I think. Uh, I, I mainly had to spend a lot of time either being very tired or actually trying to hunt a bath because I was aching that much. Uh, um, yeah. Mauritius aiming her guns at us. Anyway, yeah, I know. I thought you'd enjoy that one. I was wondering who would notice it. And please note, she's mm, only naming aiming nine of 12 guns at you. Only nine. Hmm. Yeah, I do agree. And I had the AstraZeneca one. Um, seemed to make sense to me. It's the, the one which has been de-risked the most. And it's basically a, a vaccine which has been around for ages, mod uh, slightly modified. They basically took the SARS vaccine and went, we will take out SARS. We will put in COVID. It's far more complicated than that, but that's yeah, dumb now. Nine is overkill. Well, considering how big the screen is and how accurate six inch guns are, that might hit something. So, Kenya. Now, I love this picture of Kenya, mainly because look at the boom going off behind her. Yes. And that picture, by the way, is taken during Operation Pedestal. So, when people tell me, ah, oh, I don't understand why aircraft cause so much damage in World War II and all this thing, I go, have you seen the size of the booms they create versus the size of the ships? This picture I use so much because of it. You literally have a cruiser sitting there going, Hello, I'm sailing along, and there is a mighty boom behind it. Now, Kenya is laid down in June 1938, launched in August 1939, and commissioned in September 1940. She is taken out of service and finally got rid of after being in reserve until, until September 1958. Oh, well, no. She's put in reserve in 1958, and she's finally scrapped in 1962. She is built by Alexander Stevenson's in Glasgow, Scotland, and she takes part in the hunt for the Bismarck, the second cruiser squadron. And it's Kenya and the cruiser Aurora, Yes, one of my very, very favorite Arafusa vessels, which surprised and sank the German tanker Belchen, which was supposed to be supplying German submarine U-93 in the Davis Straits in June 1941. She takes part in Operation Stonewall, which was designed to intercept U-boats, uh, which were escorting outbound blockade runners through the Bay of Biscay into the Atlantic. 
Uh, after providing escorts of multi convoy at Halberd on the 24th of September or 1st of October, uh, 24th September to the 1st of October, um, Kenny and the crews of Sheffield made to intercept the blockade runner at Rio Grande, destined for Japan and escorted by U204. Rio Grande escaped, but another blockade runner, Kota Penang, was sunk on the 3rd of October west of Cape Finisterre. Now, it was recently revealed that Kenya, well, not that recently revealed, but I say in 1942, Kenya transports 10 tons of gold from the Soviet Union to the United States to pay for the loans and war materials. Uh, she managed to avoid air attacks by Germans on the 27th and 28th of March. In sort of that in 1942, and managed to avoid quite a lot of damage in various other attacks, which meant she received a nickname in this period. Now, you would think it would be a lucky lady or something like this, but no, uh, Mountbatten had had an idea. Oh, good lord. Mountbatten had had an idea, and the idea was you paint ships pink. And it's supposed to be for a camouflage color uh, sort of to disappear from sight in sort of, you know, I don't know, Arctic conditions, I presume. Anyway, Mountain Band Pink or Plymouth Pink, and uh, so she's called the Pink Lady. Um, while supporting the, uh, the commando raid against uh, Velasoy Island off the Norwegian coast, uh, Operation Archery. <sighs> she survived she was not hit arguably some point because the pink camouflage blended in with the pink marker dye the Germans were using in their shells preventing German spotters from distinguishing between shell splattage and the ship I think it's just because they were laughing so much at seeing a Royal Navy ship painted pink um, then Kenya takes part in escorting Arctic convoys, and that's when she's carrying the gold. Now, Kenya has goes through the Far East. She does all sorts of operations, Operation Pedestal, etc., in the Mediterranean. And then she goes post-war. She is on the American West Indies Station. Yeah, the Royal Navy maintains a cruiser there. In 1949, she's reactivated, well, she's then put in reserve, and then she's upgraded, and then she's reactivated in 1949 to replace the cruiser London on the Far East Station, which means she arrives just in time for the Korean War. She bombards Choda uh, in preparation for landing of 200 Republican of Korean troops uh, there, but unfortunately the troops never showed up. She also... Um, she took part in the supporting of Incheon and various operations up there. Um, took some trips to Singapore. Yeah, has a has a standard career. Following Korean War, she Kenya had an extensive year long refit at Chatham with new radars and the San Asian of light anti aircraft arms on the five twin Mark V Bofors and the eight single 40mm guns. She then is sent back to take part in Korean War bombardment duties and then she's refitted again and meant to serve as a replacement for Superb on the West Indian Station. And as I said, paid off in August 1958 then put into reserve, and finally scrapped in 1962. Kenya has an interesting career. She's a cute ship. Chair how were the torpedo tubes used on the Crown Colony class cruisers? Exactly the same as the town class. They were there to be swung out and if necessary, uh, to fire at ships which were bigger than they that they couldn't take on. Excuse me a second, I'm just going to find my phone to turn on my heater.
Dan Freeman, my agent is Kenya saying, sorry, you're too slow or demonstrating the amazing running abilities of Kenny's? Possibly. She was certainly a fast ship. In fact, there's a few people who reckon I reckon she went faster than the, um, they declared. But we'll leave that to one side. Certainly leave that one to one side. And before anyone asks what I'm doing with my phone, so I don't have to wander to a very, well, ungainly position and basically get underneath here to turn on the heating, I have a smart plug on the heater so I can turn it on from my phone. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this plane was peppered with shrapnel by Air in France looking at the puff pad around it. Certainly having fun. That's okay. Wait, you mean those aren't Corvettes or destroyers? No. That's got pink. Well, no, not to clash of blue. Mm hmm. That's a shot. Pink reflects the less, uh, less than most colors, but black and. That uh, looks weird. Hmm. Encounter. See also desert pink SAS Land Rovers. Yes, that's the SAS though, Dan. That's the SAS. In car. PR Spitfires were sometimes also painted pink. Mm-hmm. Rosati. Shades of the submarine in the film Operation Petticoat. Don't go there. How dare you doubt the wisdom of Mountbatten? He's heard about the days without night and thinks that there'll be huge tracks of time that count as dawn and dusk. Mm -hmm. Take care, Wesley. Good luck. And it's... They are fun ships. They are really fun ships. Now, I'm going to put this up here for a second, and I'll be back in a second. Someone's just popped to the door. So, as you can see, we've got a very busy time coming up. I've got World War II TV tomorrow, Operation Claymore, which is actually the anniversary of us today, but uh, they've got a land war guy on today, and I'm going to be talking about the Navy ship, the ship side of it tomorrow. So, that's me on World War II TV. And let's see, what else am I supposed to do at some point? Uh, yeah, I'm supposed to say, if you like the videos, please like them. If you would like to see more, please subscribe. Maybe press the little bell down there. I'm also supposed to say, uh, please consider Discord to come join the chat. Patreon if you want to fund my book habit, which my mom was already worried I'm going to need a... Um, need a, an annex added onto this place for them. I was considering just building up. 
or eventually getting my own place, but that's, you know, money allowing. And, um, yeah, what else? Oh, yes. And if anyone wants to consider doing a super chat, that's always nice. That usually goes to more to my takeaways and books and pretty much everything else. But hey, or in the case of some, which he gave me super, uh, uh, super chats towards me doing some sort of stuff with the lighting in here. You should note that whilst the curtain which I've ordered has not arrived from the lovely IKEA, the blind has. So I have a nice blue blind which is going up there, and eventually, this you know, all these things are going to be blue curtains as well, which are sort of a pale blue I can use as my sort of surface which I can bounce light off. We reckon. We reckon. Anyway. World War II TV is a YouTube channel. Um, you can track it down on YouTube. It's a good movie, though. It is. Pet Petticoat Submarine is a good movie. <laughs> no, I'm not leaving you. We have got a whole rest of the Fiji group to go through before we get into the Salon group. <laughs> uh, what did the Bracolin class hit with their torpedoes? Okay, this is stuff we'll get into, but... Honestly, they didn't use them as often as the town class. The town class seemed to have had more opportunity to use their torpedoes, mainly due to the kind of battles they were in. But some of the ones we'll be getting to do get to them in the next sort of group. Hello, Warm Pump. Thank you for joining Discord. No, I'm not leaving you. I have, I have far too much to do. I'm basically halfway through. So, next one is Trinidad. This is probably will be going on till about 10 o'clock this evening. I do realize that. Wait, the World War II channel with Indy? Yes. Uh, let me check. World War II TV. Let me just look it up. Mm. Uh, it's probably better if I don't do it while I'm trying to do a live on there. So I will just start talking about Fiji while looking it up on my phone. So HMS, and you should be seeing this now, HMS Trinidad should have come up. Hopefully. And we're now in Fiji Group 2. Yes, I know this picture isn't that great, but it's a picture taken from HMS Fury, the destroyer, on an Arctic convoy, and that's why I love it. Uh, Jeff Peter, I love how the RN would not let the Royal Canadian Navy and Royal New Zealand Navy rename their colonies because it would hurt the national morale of Uganda and Gambia. As a result, most Canadians don't know we had a World War II cruiser. Um, it, that really wasn't all of it. Um, Uh, Stephen White, that's why we're doing bilge pumps. They're hard to categorize ship classes nowadays. That's why bilge pumps are doing their work on ratings. Uh, well, ma'am, how many Crown Colonies class crews were I just joined. Uh, there were 11. So trust me, we've only got, we're only on number five. We've got plenty to go. Take care, Jane Thank you for watching. 
Right, so. HMS Trinidad, or C-46. She was laid down in April 1938, launched March 1931, and commissioned October 1941. She was damaged in an air attack and scuttled on the 15th of May 1942. What was she doing? Well, she was escorting PQ-13. She and other escorts were in combat with German Narvik class destroyers. So these are the German destroyers produced after the experience in Narvik, where, of course, the Royal Navy tribal class destroyers go, Hello, are you the German destroyer force? The German destroyer force goes, Yes, we are. The Royal Navy tribals go, No, you're not. You're sunk. Um, she managed to damage the German destroyer Z-26 and then launched the torpedo attack. Unfortunately, one of her torpedoes had a fault, and... This meant that rather than hit the German destroyers with torpedoes, because the uh, torpedo was going far below 46 knots it was supposed to, it meant that Trinidad managed to torpedo herself, losing 32 personnel, 32 of her crewmen. Trinidad was tow clear of the action and was then able to proceed under her own power towards Mamanx. The German submarine U-378 attempted to engage and sink the cruiser, but was spotted. And HMS Fury, the destroyer which took this photo, managed to uh, deter the German submarine. On the 30th of May 1942, uh, she was to be escorted by the destroyers Foresight, Forrester, Somali, and Matchless. Yes, there is a tribal-class destroyer arrived to come and check on things, along with an M-class. So there are two quite big destroyers here. Other ships of the home fleet were providing a covering force nearby. Her speed was reduced to 20 knots owing to the damage she'd sustained, and the fact that in the moments they hadn't been able to repair her that much. En route, she was attacked by more than 20 Ju-88 bombers. And all the attacks are missed except for one bomb that struck near the previous damage and starting a serious fire. 63 men from her crew were, uh, the crew were lost, including 20 survivors from the cruiser Edinburgh, which had been sunk two weeks earlier and were trying to come home aboard her. So she was scuttled on the 15th of May, tor being torpedoed by matchless. <sighs> hmm. And that is how she died. So, she literally, HMS Trinidad, the cruiser that managed to torpedo herself. It wasn't a return to sender uh, or a circular run. No, it was something far worse than that. So, here are the destroyers supposed to be going across here. She's doing this. She fires at them. Then she's doing her zigzag. And her, one of her zigzags goes in front of the torpedo, and she gets sunk. Well, not sunk, but she gets enough damage. That means she gets trapped in Russia, and once you're trapped in Russia, things don't, good things don't happen to you. Really good things don't... Uh, really uh, very bad things happen to you. Dan Freeman, RN Travel Class, uh, doing their bit to help make exciting new homes for the flesh, uh, fish out of the Kriegsmarine 1939 uh, uh, to 1945? Yes. No, it wasn't a Mark 14. It was a Royal Navy torpedo. Eventually, it worked out what happened was the torpedo was so cold, it had developed a fault because of the cold in the Arctic. In Kalt, they didn't. The Germans didn't name a destroyer class Narvik after it. In fact, they don't give their destroyers name; they give them numbers. But basically, destroyers after Narvik are called the Narvik class destroyers because they're ordered after the experience of Narvik, and they all basically are destroyers on steroids. See, I miss destroyers and light cruisers. Nice, 2,000 plus gearing or tribal, but 
guess with 20,000 ta- uh, uh, 20, souls of nuke power, they uh, got overmatched by the prey. I don't think that they're, they're that quite big, but you know, there are some of them which are interesting. Go away, Norton. You're starting to annoy me. That's all. I don't know. Money Seeker 40. How does a torpedo run that side? Literally because it's cold. They don't think its motor was, they think its motor was slightly blocked and not really working. At least her crew mostly got a safety. Better than being dumped in the Arctic Sea. Oh, that's true. It's far better, but, you know. Not a nice experience for them. Yeah. Shumac. Um, because clearly, the yeah, problem with Narvik was the RN had trouble hitting them because they were too small. Yes. Well, no, they basically decided that what we're going to do is we're going to make them even more cruiser-like and even slower rates of fire. And the Royal Navy basically went, Oh, hey! These are the cruisers we want to fight. Actually, talking about World War II tomorrow, World War II TV, So it's, uh, let's see, da, 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 da. I've got all the details. And it is World War II, and oh, you can't see it. Uh, literally, WW2 TV, World War II TV, WW2. And, you know, he's a nice guy and done some very interesting stuff. Dan Freeman, Germany, making destroyers of all the weakness of cruisers and light cruisers that can't actually cruise anywhere. Ye pretty much, yes. Ah, oh, Trinidad. But here is a question which comes up. So, why is there an HMS Trinidad, which is a cruiser, and yet Trinidad, the colony's name is Trinidad and Tobago? Well, I have a reason for you. There is HMS Tobago, yes! They do not just get HMS Trinidad, the cruiser which torpedoes itself. They get HMS Tobago, the frigate which does actually quite a lot of damage. Now, these frigates are actually built in America. They are built to American lines, and they're pretty darn cool. They are uh, 1,284 tons. They are 303 feet, 11 inches long. Uh, 37 feet, 6 inches wide in the beam, and their draft is 13 foot 8 inches. They have three boilers supplying two steam turbines, which each generate 5,500, not 5,500, 5, jeez, that'd be a lot, shaft horsepower for their shafts, for each of their shafts, giving a top speed of 20 knots. You can always tell I type these things in myself rather than get them from anywhere else, can't you? The spelling mistakes that go through and manage to knit it through. Got to get this and start getting, not have this idea to add these things in about 10 minutes before going live, haven't I? Anyway. Armament. Three 3-inch 50, AM, uh, 50 AA guns in single mounts. Uh, four 40mm guns in two twin mounts. Nine 20mm in nine single mounts. One hedgehog projector. Eight wide gun depth charge projectors, two depth charge racks. Now, I can't can find, actually find a picture of HMS Tobago, which I was really upset about. Um, all I heard was, uh, 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 but, you know, I did find HMS Dominica. 
and they look a cool little frigate. They really do look a good little frigate. Now, Tobago was technically HMS Hong Kong. She was planned to be called Hong Kong, but then they decided to switch her to the name to Tobago. Why? Because Trinidad torpedoed itself. Yay! There's also, as you can see, HMS Aguila, HMS Antigua, HMS Ascension, HMS Bahamas, HMS Barbados, HMS Caligus, HMS Cayman, HMS Dominica, HMS Lourbon, HMS Montserrat, HMS Nesford, HMS Papua, HMS Perim, HMS Pitcairn, HMS Sarawak, HMS Shells, HMS Somaliland, HMS Sahela, HMS Tobatola, and HMS Zanzibar. So they're a cool little class. You can actually think of it here, though. Here's a little thing. They had a crew of 190. So I think there are technically more crew on board HMS Pitcairn than there are actually in the Pitcairn Islands. Well, now, there's certainly not. Amok had an uncle who was a merchant sailor, did several Arctic runs, never talked about it. Yeah, it would have been really, really not fun. What time is the World War Two channel uh, TV channel stuff on uh, YouTube? I think it's. I'm not sure. I think it's the same time as it was sort of today, sort of thing. I think it's roughly, um, roughly six is uh, six thirty ish. Um, it's live. I do know it's going to be a live chat. Uh, we haven't managed to test any of the materials out. I don't think. And I know he takes questions off Facebook and YouTube at while we're talking. I was asking. Actually, German Narvik type destroyers were designated Type 1936A. First one started construction in 1938 and has been launched in 1939. So prior to Narvik being a beating increase, when got well, that's the interesting thing. Some of the Narvik designation is put back. Um, I would say the 1936A. I wouldn't really call a Narvik destroyer. Um, I would say the. Germans, Narvik destroyers, I would say the ones which come after the 1936 A's, which I'm going to remember, which are. Uh, oh, German destroyer. 19. Yeah, 1936 destroyer. Uh, and then we have the succeeded by. Uh, succeeded by, yeah. I would say you're more talking the 36Bs. I would go uh, Narvik Destroyers. I would say the 36As. <clears throat> Probably the mob, um, Z31 to 39. Are definitely Narvix. <laughs> but when you start looking at those, you know, there's 26 sunk by Trinidad and Destroyer Eclipse, there's 27 sunk by Glasgow and Enterprise. Um, uh, so many of these ships get sunk. And of course, there's Z32, which is damaged. In the Battle of Ashanton Beach, after a battle with Haidan Huron. Ooh, you know, tribals hunting them down. We build a special class of destroyers to f take on the tribals, and the tribals still come and take it. Um, Topega was built in an American yard. They're all built in an American yard. There's God. Coal can cause major issues for fuel feeds. A British Airways Boeing 777 was brought down by tiny ice crystals in the fuel. Usually don't cause issues, but clog the fuel filler. Ouch. Adrian Ford, hello! Are they based on any particular class of USN ship? Uh, I think one of the, the, the American frigate designs they're based on. There are a few equivalents. Uh, there are some destroyer escorts, which are some similar to them. But mainly frigates. Hmm. Thanks, Sean, Matt. Uh, let's see. I have got... Carefully, because I knew this question might come up. I have... The opening on the colony class frigates. And 
they were built as basically a version of the Tacoma class patrol frigates. So the Tacoma class, as they're called, and the Americans build 96 of them. So that's what they're based off, the Tacoma class. I can't recall which the specific yard the colony class in. I can look it up in my notes. I'm more than likely have it in my notes. I have most things in my notes. <sighs> They were constructed by Walsh Kaiser of Providence, Rhode Island. So they were built by the Walsh Kaiser, yeah, Walsh Kaiser, uh, the Walsh Kaiser Yards. They're cool little ships. When did these frigates serve? They served, I think, 1940... I think they get into those quite quickly. I think it's 1943 to 5. I think possibly some get into those almost 1942. But uh, what was I hunting for? Oh, my own brew. That's what I was hunting for. And now, turning the heater off. It's now warm enough. Sure, Quinn. Is this an example of our own humor? American belt boats being called the colony class? Yes. Well, mainly it was because the Americans insisted we couldn't call them the frigate class because they were based on the British. They were basically... The coma class design is based off an Americanization of the river class design which the british were using and the british were building so then the americans then said we'll build some of these for you okay the british went oh, we'll call river class oh no 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 they're gonna be they're based on other side okay you have to call them something different we will colony class <laughs> they resisted the urge to call one new york though Now it's on to Jamaica. Now, Jamaica is a very, very cool one of the uh, ships. And, of course, Jamaica has uh, her own lovely history. Her motto, not for oneself, but for one's country, could, ask you, it could be said to have inspired a certain speech by a certain American president, but we don't know it. Her nicknames included the Fighting J and the Galloping Ghost of the North Korean Coast. And that is a picture from inside one of her Mark, her Mark 23 six inch turrets. Yes, they are wearing their anti flash gear. Yes, that is as not fun as it looks, but you can see comparatively spacious that that picture makes it look almost until you realize they are literally manning one of the guns, only one of the three guns. When you start realizing you're going to have treble that amount of people at least going around there, plus more, they're all sorting out powder and charges, you start to realize why they get so cramped. Jamaica was built uh, by Vickers Armstrong, Barrows in a Furnace, laid down April 1939, launched November 1940, and commissioned June 1941 at uh, 42. 
she'd be decommissioned in November 1957 and stricken from the list and broken up in 1960. Now, her displacement was reckoned to be about 8,770 tons in standard load, and her deep load was actually 11,194 tons. Yes, the figures I gave earlier were the class averages, officially. But sometimes you find individual ships have an interesting perspective on that. After she had worked up and managed to complete and enter service in 1942, she provides this in cover to PQ-18. That's convoy PQ-18. She's then assigned. She does quite well there, and she's then assigned to the Centre Task Force of Operation Torch in early November, where she's unsuccessfully attacked by the Vichy French submarine Fresnel. Yes. Guess what? Some of the Vichy French submarines did decide that they were going to side on a fight for the Axis. Fun times. And the Arctic convoys um, had been suspended after, at, after PQ-18, but resumed with convoy JW-51A in December. HMS Jamaica and HMS Sheffield, with several escorting destroyers, formed False R under the command of Rear Admiral Robert Burnett and were tasked to cover the convoy against German Sherpa ships. The convoy was not spotted by the Germans and actually arrived at Koala Incident without in, uh, on Koala Inlet without incident, but on Christmas Day, 1942. She then takes part in the Battle of the Barents Sea. Force R sailed from Kuala on the 27th of December, so they'd had Christmas in Russia, which is just where you think about we're having Russia. What you dream about is having Christmas and Boxing Day in Kuala Inslet in northern Russia in the middle of World War II. That is where everyone wants to have that Christmas. By gull, that party's going to be massive. There are going to be all sorts of people singing things. And the British will probably be strolling out Good King Winslow on a regular occasion just to wind up their Soviet hosts. Unfortunately, they sail on 27 December to rendezvous with convoy JW-51B in the Norwegian Sea, but it had been blown southwards by a major storm. Yes, sometimes even ships, when they're outside the edge of the sail, get blown off course because the seas get so rough. Several of the ships had been separated during the storm, and forces are this, and that confused the radar of forces are ships as to the true location of the convoy. Thus, Force R was 13 miles north of the convoy on the morning of 31 of December when the heavy cruiser Admiral Hipper decided to attack the convoy. However, Admiral Hipper was held at bay by the British destroyers HMS Onslow, HMS Obedient, HMS Obdurate, and Orwell, uh, led by Commander Sherbrooke, former tribal class and actually HMS Cossack commanding officer. Now, Captain. Initially driven off, Admiral Hipper returned, only to find Force Air R had arrived, and she was quickly hit by three six-inch shells from the cruisers. Two German destroyers, Z-16, Friedrich Enghut, and Z-4, Richard Belson, misidentified Sheffield as Admiral Hipper and actually attempted to form up on her. Sheffield was very kind, and she decided to sink Frederick Eidhout at a range of two miles, while Jamaica was unsuccess uh, managed to unsuccessfully engage Richard Bison at a roughly three and a half miles. Less than an hour later, Forsar spotted the pocket battleship Lutzau and Admiral Hipper together. So they opened fire because they decided that they were a town class and a crown colony, and that in their book was a match for Lutzau and Hipper on any day of the week. Unfortunately, neither side scored any hits in the darkness before both sides turned away. Forsar continued to track the German ships for several hours on radar, but they eventually lost contact. And although the destroyer HMS Acantes and the minesweeper HMS Bramble were sunk by the Greek Marine, the convoy managed to reach Carl Inlet intact. Force R remained at sea to protect convoy RA-51, which was that was returning to Great Britain, until relieved by HMS Berwick and HMS Kent, who would have a far less eventful time and actually be quite annoyed because they felt that as they were, you know, 
Bounty class cruisers, where was their fun? If they'd both been there, there'd have been no chance of Hippa and Lutzow getting away. That would have been their meat and potatoes for all day long. Um, in 1940, January 1943, Jamaica was relieved of escort duties and her main gun barrels had to be replaced in March that year because they'd been used so much. She then rejoins the home fleet and at some point in this during this year receives an upgrade with um, six twin powered operated 20mm AA guns as well as four single 20mm AA guns. So she now has 16 20 millimeter added onto her. During November, she protects the convoys RA-54B, JW-54A, JW-54B, and RA-54B. RAs being the returned ones, JWs being the ones out there. But was not engaged. On the 15th of December 1943, she was assigned to Force 2, the distant envoy escort convoy for, escort for convoy JW-55A, with the battleship HMS Duke of York and four destroyers. Force 2 was commanded by Admiral Bruce Fraser, Commander-in-Chief of the Home Fleet, and they were waiting for a specific prey. For the first time, the British distant cover force escorted and convoy all the way to Kuala Internet, and their passage was uneventful. So Force 2 sailed back on the 18th of December to refuel Iceland. Before reaching his destination, Fraser received ultra information that told him that what he'd been out hunting and waiting for had happened. Scharnhorst was at sea, and was likely to attack convoy JW-55B, which was already on its way. This led to the Battle of North Cape. Now, the Germans are initially engaged by the cruisers Belfast, Sheffield and Norfolk. Yes, Sheffield, lovely Jamaica's old friend from the Battle of the Barents Sea, was out on her own with Belfast and Norfolk. And they were hunting, and they again decided that, frankly, yes, this might be a battleship, but we can take her. And we've got destroyers with us, so we're fine. Meanwhile, uh, Jamaica and the Duke of Nork managed to approach from the southwest, stopping and uh, cutting off Sharnhorst's path of retreat. When the German battleship decided to turn for her base at Athelford in the early afternoon after two brief encounters with the British cruisers, uh, she was spotted by the Duke of York's Type 273 radar at a range of 45,000 yards. Duke of York opened fire at about half an hour after she'd spotted her. At a range of 45,500 yards. Jamaica fired her first salvo a minute later than the Duke of York did. And she managed to hit the Scharnhorst on her third broadside. She was forced to cease fire after 19 volleys of the German ship uh, as the, well, basically, as the sea, heavy seas meant that the German ship, which was larger, was actually faster than the British ships and was managing to open range despite getting damaged by shells. However, H Duke of York's last volley managed to penetrate Sharnos' number one boiler room and effectively destroys it. This reduced German speed sufficiently for the British destroyers to catch up and make four torpedo hits using a pincer attack. This slowed the ship again, so that Jamaica and Duke of York also caught up and opened fire at a range of 10,400 yards, basically spitting distance when you're dealing with guns these bigs, and they hit the German ship continually. But she wasn't sinking after 20 minutes of firing, so Jamaica was ordered to torpedo her. Two torpedoes from her first volley of three missed, and the third misfired. So the cruiser had to turn about to fire another, her other broadside of three, two of which appeared to hit. Then Belfast and the destroyers turn up, and they also fire torpedoes before Sharnhorst finally sinks. She then has a very successful following war. She takes part in, a ra in further convoys, raids on turpits. Um, she convoys King George the Thick, Sixth and the Queen uh, and um, Queen Elizabeth on a visit to the Channel Islands in June 1945. On the sixth of June, nineteen forty-five, precisely. Uh, Jamaica, and then she joins the Fifth Cruiser Squadron at Colombo in October and replaced HMS Norfolk as the flagship uh, for that group in April 1946. 
She takes part in the Korean War, where she gets involved in many, many operations there. And finally, post-war, she gets to play H. Miss Exeter in the film The Battle of the River Plate. So when you're watching The Battle of the River Plate, which I recommend and highly believe you, everyone should watch The Battle of the River Plate on movie at least once every four months. And I'm just going to quickly go back from Gambia, despite me timing this absolutely perfectly. You, uh, it's HMS Jamaica you see whenever they return to Exeter. Yeah. Hello. So. For some reason, it stopped my thing. Stopped. It, it, I'm sure I've got more questions because I can sort of see some, but it stopped at Stuart Quinn's one. So I'm going to re pop out the chat if that makes sense. Ah, that would explain why I haven't been having any questions, Bings, and I've just kept talking. Hello, now I can see a lot more questions. Why did that do that? I have no idea. Hello everyone. I hope I haven't missed anything. So let's uh, let's go back to da, 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 da. there. You go. Um, is it time for a new county class? It's always time for a new county class. Um, Only sixteen forty anti flash gear. Yes, that's them wearing their anti flash gear in nineteen forty. 1943, I think that's uh, that picture was taken. Hmm. That frame, come, saw that name for the replacement of Type 45s, as we can't afford to have any of those cuts. We need more than six Type 45s, and we need to not have such a long wait for new ones. <laughs> come, I, I thought the town, colony, uh, town colonies were only cruisers. Did we have frigates of those class, I know? Yeah, we did have colony class frigates as well. Um, as I was showing earlier, we had the colony class frigates. Basically, the crown colonies were for big colonies, the big crown colonies, and the smaller colonies got a frigate. Uh, Shomak, do you know how the RM went, uh, went about arriving at that average? I, I, I'm not sure, because the, I've just got all the questions in one lump, I'm not sure where it was I was saying that, so you can have to find a bit more information, I'm sorry. Let me see if I, I do quite like it. It's not the class average. It's the class average officially. Yeah, ah, that's the average. Yes, yes. The, the, the how do the iron go? Um, well, you have to remember these things are all filed theoretically because you can't actually weigh a ship officially. Unofficially, you can put it in a dry dock, take out the water, and work out how much volume of water it dispelled. But leave that on one side. You can't officially weigh a ship. So the average is done by maths. I I know how much steel weighs, I know how much this, so therefore I work it all out. That room, it's Christmas. Ah, and it's Christmas, so it's no, 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 it's stupid Gregorian calendar users. Also, no religion in glorious USSR. Actually, there was a lot of religion in USSR. You have to remember. Um, the Orthodox Church remained very powerful the whole way through the Soviet Union. Many six forty was the Lutzal the previously Deutschland? Yes, she was previously the Deutschland. Sheffield has a, seems to have a knack for being misidentified as a German arc royal swordfish for she was Bismarck. Yeah, she has fun with that. Sometimes it's more advantage than others. Manitiki who's barrels replaced? Jamaica's barrels were replaced. 
Yoke Khan, per Tip Wikipedia, Tacoma class were built on the West, East, and Great Lakes areas. Hmm. Uh, Dan Freeman, I, Angel from Sheffield. As I said, um, it's the Kaiser Valors, I think. Well, uh, 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 Kaiser Walsh or something. Yard. Um, Adrian Sheffield, playing the penalty for playing the bad e-commerce raider in too many pre-war exercises. It works on this occasion. She gets a German destroyer to form up on her. That's nice. At that range, six-inch guns. The German destroyer forms up and goes, Hello, we're friends! And then they go, Those are six-inch guns! Oh, sugar! And Sheffield's just going, Yep! Fire! Everything! Sorry to... Uh, Interrupt, uh, Josh, uh, my, uh, doc, but your mic is peaking quite a bit. Let me have a little fun with the mic and just check if I can modify things a bit. So, hopefully that stops the peaking a bit much. Uh, I do like to talk a lot. I do realise that. Uh, okay, right, so that should also work as a compressing a bit. So hopefully that has an effect on improves the audio. Sorry about that. Um, you can all the colony class are building right on. Yes, I think so. So, uh, Stephen M. Sheffield of Jamaica later reuniting post war to help make the Battle of the Plate movie. Yes. They do have fun. Uh, H. For Sheffield. We go. Uh, Carmen. We good. We got 27 six inch guns plus the destroyer's guns. All those tops were just pomlet. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, they had. Let's see. No, they had 12 and 12, so they had 24 six inch guns. Still enough. Dan Freeman, Iron Crew is on upon discovering a German battleship. We don't need no battleship. No, we don't. We have torpedoes if they really get problematic. On a positive note, YouTube chat will load what was said before you load it. Ah, that is a good thing about it. Um, Rian Carl, Rian Burnett sounds a proper character. Oh, he is. Jeff Adam, other than Trinidad hitting herself, did a colony ever hit anything with torpedoes? Well, we've been over it. They tried. <laughs> Jamaica did hit her target in channels with the torpedoes. It just didn't have much of an effect. <laughs> she hit her. <laughs> Everyone kept hitting channels with torpedoes. It was a case of at one point they were going, Duke of York, do you want to come in and give it a go? Well, I might as well. <laughs> Yeah, Jamaica was Exodus standing. Was it the same movie as U.S. of Cleveland as Grass Bay? Yes. Pauline the fact that Deutschland is renamed Lutzal is really confusing when you first read about the sale of the other Lutzal to the USSR. Yes, it does cause fun. Um, did the 40 million bit like we can join into? I think at that range, everything was firing. So I was at Walmart today. Before leaving, I asked an employee at the self checkout area if there was an upper level management available. They said, Not really. I must uh, say, uh, say, look on the place. It's rather interesting. I said, Well, there's a bomb back in electronics. I figured I should tell someone in management. Um, why did my messaging with my dinner get removed? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. Sheffield should have sent light signals to the German leaders to defect. You are our prisoners. If you torpedo launches move, we will fire. 
well, they could have done, but there was a big heavy cruiser they were also doing at the same time. Um, hello, Carl. Must be 1583 uh, of change in Catholic countries, was it? Just two centuries earlier. Hmm. I believe that's the Gregorian calendar going on. <laughs> I love Hurricane. Ah, oh boy, this will be good and long. I am playing catch up and just start to Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> um, out of curiosity, what type of 16 shells are they using the crowns? Well, they're the same as the town class ones. They have the choice of armor piercing or high explosive. And they're fairly decent shells. This is the thing. They are fairly decent shells. They're on the they're sort of they're carrying. Uh, it's it's the Royal Navy. It's six inch guns. We love them. We it, we are absolutely obsessed with them by this point in you know in our history. And now HMS Gambia. Now Gambia spends nineteen forty three to forty six in service with the Royal New Zealand Navy. So, but. The reason the New Zealanders aren't allowed to rename her is because they never actually buy her. So she's on loan, technically. So basically, we want to rename her, and it's a case of, well, are you going to buy her? No, then you can't rename her. If you own her, you can name her. If you don't own her, you can't. It's the same as if you borrow a friend's car. You do not rename it. And you preferably don't crash it. She was built by Swan Hunter at Tyne and Weir, Newcastle. Uh, she's laid down July 1939, launched November 1940, commissioned February 1942. Transferred to the operation of the Royal New Zealand Navy on 22nd of September 1943. So, she served in the East Indies with the British Eastern Fleet and was involved in the Battle of Madagascar in September 1942. She then carried out trade protection duties in the ocean, but returned to home waters, calling in Ga Gambia on the way, where the West African chiefs in full regalia led thousands of their subjects to visit the ship named after their colony and bless her. So she gets the full blessing, like Ashante had, like New Zealand had in World War One. She has the full blessing and affections. She's then refitted in Liverpool between June and September that year. Now, at this point, she's then transferred to the Royal New Zealand service. And so she's been blessed by the people of Gambia, and she's transferred to New Zealand. Reason is because Leander and Achilles are both damaged, so she's recommissioned as HMZS uh, New Gambia, but she's not owned by them. She's under the command of Captain William Pollock of the Royal Navy. Uh, and a few officers and three quarters of the ratings were New Zealanders, though. On the 3rd of October 1943, New Zealand High Commissioner visited Gambia and addressed the ship's companies. After sea trials, shaking down, and 10 days attached to the first cruiser squadron, Scapa Flow, um, she was sent to Plymouth on the 5th of December 1943 to work with Glasgow and Enterprise on the orders of the Commander in Chief Plymouth. With these ships, she was to take part again in Operation Stonewall. Notice this keeps coming up, this operation, Stonewall, this idea of dropping and dropping, uh, of stopping German blockade runners. On particular note, there's a pursuit of the Osarano and the destruction of another one. Which was an interesting scenario where Captain William Powell was an overall commander, so he was the senior officer of the four cruisers but was unable to take part in successful siding operation uh, carried out by Glasgow and Enterprise because they were too far away. So instead, they were just listening in on the radio and trying to help where they could. She then goes and serves with the British Pacific Fleet and participates in attack on Japanese oppositions throughout the Pacific. In February 1944, she was hunting for blockade runners in the Caucasus Islands, and then she supported a series of carrier raids against oil installations and airfields. She saw action off Okinawa, Formosa, Formosa, 
and took part of the uh, in the bombardment of the Japanese city of Kamishi on the 9th of August. She was attacked by Japanese ka uh, kamikaze aircraft as the sea fire was announced and fired some last shots of World War II and is actually involved in Tokyo Bay for the uh, signing of the Japanese instrument of surrender. And that picture is of her as sort of quite new. She is returned to the Royal Navy in 1946, where she undergoes a refit and is recommissioned to the 5th Cruiser Squadron for the Far East in 1946 as well. She then returns to the UK in 1948 and in January 1950 is assigned to the 2nd Cruiser Squadron of the Mediterranean. Then later goes on to serve the 1st Cruiser squ uh, Squadron in the same station in 19 until 1954. In 1953, she and her sister Bermuda brought aid to the Greek island of Zakynos when it was stuck by the Ionian earthquake. And Greek officials would later comment, we Greeks have a long-standing tradition in the Royal Navy, and it lived up to every expectation in this infallible tradition of always being the first to help. Then she takes part in the fleet review to, co uh, to celebrate the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. She then goes on to become the flagship of the 4th Cruiser Squadron East Indies Station, but the decision not to continue the refit of the battleship Vanguard meant funds were available for a life extension of Gamma and Bermuda, with additional finance and equipment uh, from US assistance to NATO. The refit gave them a final light anti-aircraft armament of nine twin 40mm Bofors, refitted in positions that gave wider angles of fire, and US Mark 63 and SBG 35 radar fire control for the four-inch mounts. Similar to that being fitted to the remaining United States Navy Baltimore class cruisers. In 1956-7, though, although the 12 twin 3-inch 50 caliber guns on the US cruisers were far more accurate and effective than either the Royal Navy's Mark V Bofors or the twin 4-inch, but they were still keeping with them because they actually preferred them. And they felt the 4-inch bang, whilst being less accurate than the 3-inch, they were thinking firing for deterrence. So the 4-inch has a far bigger bang and explosion, so it has a far wider area of effect. In 1957, Gambia sailed for the Persian Gulf, becoming the last flagship for the Commander-in-Chief in the East Indies, the Vice Admiral Hillary Biggs, and returned to Arasaif in 1958. On the 4th of November 1958, she was recommissioned to the 1st Cruiser Squadron Mediterranean, and then she deploys to the Far East on, in December 1959 to, remove, uh, to relieve her sister Ceylon in the Red Sea. She returns to the UK via South Africa with a visit to Freetown and Gambia, before arriving in Portsmouth in July 1960. And then, last month in 1960, she serves the South Atlantic home fleet before entering reserve and her crew largely going to the new cruiser Blake. She's paid off the reserve in 1960 and she is finally sent for scrap in 1968. So she has quite a long career. If you think about that, She's launched in 19, uh, she's commissioned in 1942 and she's finally goes to scrap in 1968. That's a fairly long career by World War II warship standards in terms of serving in World War II and keep going. Although there are a few aircraft carriers which of course match that. Peters, a Salem pose to Graf Spain. A uh, very creative camera angle, so ignore the extra turret, or did they leave it in? They left it in. You can see it in some of the pictures. So you might, uh, one of these days, they will do a naval battle with this again. Uh, we do not need Koshin's 55. We need Sink the Bismarck and River Plate 2. Mm, as long as they do it better than they did the Midway. That's the trouble. If it's the same people who do Midway, I'd, I'd rather they didn't. I'd rather they leave it alone. Um... Vision. HMS Jamaica was on China Station during Yangtze and involving uh, Amazon. Yeah. You know, hear me out. Band of Brothers style series about destroy one destroyer cruiser crew or dreams. Ooh, that could be fun. Have to be one of the crew destroyers or cruisers which served the whole way through World War II and didn't have much time off. That's just cruel, Dan, but, you know. 
I'll accept it, but that's cruel. Uh, Ryan. So Gambia is a fun ship. She has a fairly decent career and a lot of experience. Hmm. Run. Was there uh, was there an HMS Guyana? I don't not in the Crown Colony class, and I don't think there was in the uh, Colony class frigates. So no. Thanks, Dean is a good film. Now this is HMS Bermuda. Now, HMS Bermuda is another fun ship, and she is the last of the Fijis. So, Bermuda, you will notice that this picture, there is an aircraft carrier in the back. That aircraft carrier is USS Essex in the North Atlantic in 1961. That's post-World War II. Um, she is laid down 19, November 1939, launched in September 1941, and actually commissioned August 1942. She's finally decommissioned and sent for scrap, uh, decommissioned in 1962 and sent for scrapping in 1965. Her displacement was 8,530 tons in standard and 10,450 tons full load. Again, please notice no, the relation to 8,000 tons. It's only 500 tons over. That's nothing. It's just 500 tons. Officially. So, she takes part in the North Africa campaign, including Operation Torch as part of the 10th Cruiser Squadron, where with the cruiser Sheffield, she was detached from Force H to attack a small coastal fort both came under attack from Italian torpedo bombs, uh, bombers, but they managed to do okay. She covered the landing at Boogie and managed to escape heavy air attacks unscathed. Again, Bermuda then returned to service in Atlantic to escort ships in the Bay of Biscay, and in June 1943, she transported men and supplies to Spitsbergen. Then takes part in anti-submarine operations against German U-boats uh, operating in the Bay of Biscay, hunting them down, and at one point, uh, apparently trying to ram one. Uh, she returns to Glasgow in June 1944 for a refit. The refit removes her ex turret, and she was then dispatched to the Pacific as the war in Europe was ending. She arrived in Fremantle on the 1st of July 1945 to take on fuel and stores before continuing to Sydney, where she arrived on the 7th of July. There she undertook exercises of other nova ships in the Far East, including the battleship Anson. Whilst in Sydney, news reached them of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the subsequent surrender of Japan. Muda then sailed for the Philippines, arriving on the 23rd of August. She then takes part in, in the operation to recover Allied prisoners for war from previously occupied Japanese territories. On the 6th of September 1945, Bermuda was attacked by Japanese aircraft, apparently unaware of the end of the war, or otherwise unwilling to surrender. Bermuda fought them off the attack and was able to continue on her way. She then transported Allied prisoners of war to Shanghai for repatriation, but this does highlight how difficult and fluid the period was. And one of the reasons why she is, you know, you have warships standing around fully armed still doing this. Because just because the war's over doesn't mean the war is over. Post-war, she remains in the Far East as a flagship of the 5th Cruiser Squadron, and where she stays until 1947, then she returns back to Chatham Dockyard, where she's refitted again. She's placed in reserve, but in 1950, she's restored to active service, and serves in South Atlantic as flagship of the Commander-in-Chief South Atlantic Station until 1953. Vice Admiral, William, uh, Vice Admiral Pearville William Pallet was Commander-in-Chief of South Atlantic 1952-54, and she was a good, he considered her a good flagship. She then goes to the Mediterranean fleet, and in 1953, she and her sister Gambia brought aid to the Greek island of Zankos, as well as being discovered for the Ionian earthquake. 
1956, she's paid off and towed up to Palmer's at Heaven on Time to undergo a long refit. She's updated largely on the same pattern as Gambia, including getting the enclosed bridge, of course, like Belfast as well also has. But she actually managed to maintain the tachymetric fire control for her twin Mark V 40mm mounts rather than the new American stuff. And there was again another reason for this. There was the British mm, felt there were better eggs of fire, but they also thought the simple tachymetric fire control system was actually easier to maintain in salt water at sea. So they were trying out, and basically they had one which had the full conversion, one which had the partial conversion, and they're planning on testing them and seeing which one was best and if which one was best they would do with the rest. Because the Royal Navy at this point was keeping quite a few cruisers. She spent the next few years on exercises of other navies or other Royal Navy units uh, with NATO, uh, NATO forces. And in April '58, she left Malta. She was at Malta and she sent to assist in reinforcing of Cyprus during this period of civil unrest. Then she attended the ceremony of independence of Nigeria on the 1st of October 1960 before joining to, uh, the Mediterranean fleet and relieving the cruiser Tiger. She managed to make during her career several visits to her namesake, and she was presented with a number of civil objects, again, as it seems to be a tradition in these warships, including a large bell, which was occasionally used as a font for holy water in the baptism of children of the crew, and four bugles. Two of the bugles later found their way to the Bermuda Regiment, and... Apart, though, one of the interesting things is that whilst the bell and the bugles, which were collected together by the Bermuda Maritime Museum at the former, former Bermuda Dockyard, and are still there today and you can go and see them, apparently two of the, two of the bugles and many of the other objects have gone have, went missing following the ship's decommissioning, and it's presumed former members of the crew might have, might have wandered off with them as keepsakes. She's a good ship. We're just a figment of your imagination, Dr. S. Clark. Oh, that's boring and that's sad, but fun in a way. Um, stop bringing up Matt Van Pink, Dan Freeman. That's just not nice. Next one will be suggesting Mount, uh, Blackburn, Blackburn painted in Mount Batten Pink. <laughs> Good lord. Um, Dan Freeman, maybe the RN should offer the way their ships on the same scale as the Italians and Japanese use for their treaty compliant ships. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing. The amount of people go, oh, the Royal Navy, they were treaty compliant. And you go, really? Are you sure? Are you sure they were? Why do you presume that the Royal Navy, which has been doing this for a long time, is and comes up with water as armor and various other things, is going to be... How do I put this? Mm. Any more prone to being compliant than you are? Ask the show. When you do the treaty way limits, like your essay word limits, it's a plus or minus 10%. Mm. <laughs> Not supposed to be, but yeah. Tachymetric, yes. <laughs> sure, mate. They are in look treaty compliant, which is my account. Yes. And as I've said regularly, the reason the RN doesn't ask more questions about other navies being treaty compliant is because... Mm -hmm. so the only people who seem to estimate navies as being treaty compliant are the intelligence services. And you sit there and go, but you know your own navy is... No, 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 it's only our navy which would, uh, which would break these rules. You sit there and go, really? You've come up, your navy has come up with these interesting ways to bend the rules. You don't think others are going to flagrantly break them? Hmm. Uh, 
Abzaski, I wish I couldn't see that with my mental eye. That's that's not nice. I'm gonna that's that's gonna require counselling to get over that image. Right, tachymetric is a very uh, uh, let me just look up the full deck of information I have on him. Now, basically, a tachymetric anti-aircraft fire control system generates target position, speed, direction, and rate of target, ra and target range change by computing these parameters directly from measured data. Okay? So, the range, height, and uh, observed bearing are fed into a computer, either by radar reports or by visual. And which uses successive observations, i.e. you've got radar coming in or you've got human um, successive human data coming in, to calculate the required elevation and bearing of A guns necessary to hit the target based upon its predicted movement. Mm, they are actually initially basically analog fire control computers. So things like the fuse keeping clock and the high angle control system are early forms of tachymetric, but it does actually accelerate. USN Mark 37 system was a tachymetric system and the high angle controls, as I said, uh, and the fuse keeping clock. We're all tachymetric. Uh, it's a it's a standard system. And it's just a phrase which turns up a lot if you deal with the 1920s, 1930s navies and World War II. Avian Empress, I think a crime against humanity has occurred in the chat. I think a crime against me has occurred in the chat. Read tachymetric, a uh, fire control. Basically, Joe reads bearing from radar and tells it a bill who dials that in. Mm, to an extent, yeah. That's just freaky. Right. So. Now that's onto the Salon group, the last three. And honestly, I was considering not including them in this because there is a lot of people who go, oh, Fiji and Salons, it's Fiji class and the Salon class. And then I was going, actually, no, they are part of the same class, if the nicest way. If I include HMS Edinburgh and HMS Belfast in the town class, and I include York and Exeter in the county class, although I, I don't think I've done a video on the county class. I think I managed to skip the counties, didn't I? I did straight through the light cruisers. I managed to skip the Hawkins and the counties, I think. I'm not sure. Some will have to check and tell me. Well, I will check and tell myself, but I will only do that tomorrow. I won't do that tonight. If anyone fancies checking now and telling me, they can do that. Um, but no. County class, I don't think I've done. Uh, so, if I'm going to treat them as part of the same class, I have to treat them as part of the same class. And it's sort of continue it on. And, yeah. Mm hmm. All right. Then. So we have HMS Salon, and yes, you will notice, those of you who eagle eyed, that there is HMS Royalist sitting out the back there. Yeah, one of my favorite cruisers. I do like Royalist.
So, HMS Salon. Laid down April 1939. Launched July 1942. Commissioned July 1943. So there is a war going on. It still takes four years, roughly, for her to get into service. Let's be honest, more than four years, considering she's laid down April 1939 and then commissioned July 1943. So there's April, May, June, July. So let's say four years, four months. Uh, after two months initial service and working up with the home fleet, she's transferred to the 4th Cruiser Squadron with the Eastern Fleet and takes part in many of the raids and operations against Japanese territory, including operations Cockpit, Meridian, and Diplomat. In November 1944, she joined the British Pacific Fleet and sailed from Trincongli on 16th January, taking part in the raid on Panklan and Baden, uh, uh, Braden on the route. In May 1945, she was back in the Indian Ocean, taking and shelling the Nicobar Islands, and remained in that theatre until the end of the war. In October 1945, she returned to England for a refit and a layup. Uh, she took part in the Korean War, and her, modern, her modernization was largely uh, as applied on her sister ships Newfoundland and Nigeria. The cost of modernization of Nigeria, which was later sold to India as Mysore, was reduced by using mainly sensors and parts originally purchased by the Royal and Australian Navy for the modernization of HMS Hobart before that was cancelled. The modernization of Ceylon was simplified instead by fitting the new 960M LRR to the original tripod ra main radar mast rather than fitting a new lattice mast. Less comprehensive electrical refitting and simplification of fire control settings by in, uh, fitting systems by not fitting the 275 fly plane directors used on Newfoundland and relying on the new MRS-8 directors supplied and paid for by the US government. Sims that used in the updating of the United States Navy's heavy gun cruisers in the 1950s. We control four, uh, four twin four-inch guns with US Mark 63 radar on the mounts. The new standard light twin Mark V twin L60 Bofors armament on Ceylon um, had only the simple tracking metrics directors added in again. After all this, Ceylon was deployed to the Mediterranean and she provided long range gunfire support to suppress Egyptian shore battery emplacements during, at Port Said uh, during the Suez Crisis of 1956. A communication officer on board the cruiser described Ceylon's bomb on as relatively brief, as the Egyptian batteries didn't return fire. In fact, they were honestly so overwhelmed they couldn't really do much else. She then serves as an air direction picket, with royalists having been withdrawn for political reasons, uh, and the cruiser Jamaica lacking modern air warning and aircraft direction equipment. So Ceylon, with her sort of limited fit, has to do it. In 1959, she returns to Portsmouth and is sold to Peru. The disposal of Ceylon so quickly after its modernization was a shock to its last captain, Frank Twiss. And in fact, he complained about this quite loudly. On February 19, 9 February 1960, she was transferred to the Peruvian Navy and renamed Colonel uh, Coronel Bolnese. Uh, the sale of her Newfoundland, while the older colony and town cruisers Gambia, Bermuda, Sheffield, and uh, Belfast remained in service, were activated re reactivable reserve uh, uh, until the election of Labour government in 1964 um, was a kind of interesting thing. There are, there are debates as to whether it was the price that was offered by Peru. There's another thing that was it was needed to save the Tiger class because if you had these ships which were so much better than the Tiger class in many ways still in service and quite relatively young compared to them, then someone might be tempted to sell the Tigers instead. So there was a bit of politics being considered being going on there. One of the fun things, though, is that um, because Newfoundland and Ceylon remain under different names from Indian Peruvian service till the 1980s, they were actually able to find some crucial parts on the maintenance of the Tigers during their career in the 1970s. 
she was only deleted from the Peruvian Navy list in May 1982 and towed to Taiwan in August 1985 to be scrapped. She's a cool ship. She really is. And there are now two more to go. So we are going to make 10 o'clock. I think the British battle the battleship New Jersey and possibly Drac, possibly on Belfast Special, have covered this. Hmm. What, no lifeboats? Uh, not as many life rafts listing the side along her, but she does ha have boats and she has uh, inflatable rafts on her. So the earlier ones. And so the delay caused by telling fire control data, then dialing in, then putting the shell into the fuse cubing clock, sounding the generous error, a margin of error allowed by six inch and eight inch flak shells, huge from the cloud, uh, outweighs range of rate of fire issues. Mm, to an extent. Shoma, I don't think you've done the counties. You still have it in your future to explain how the RM managed to make a single purpose. Uh, uh, heavier than a dual purpose turret. Ah, oh, that's going to be fun. That will be in my future. Again, I'm putting, yeah, I'm putting little faces and smiley faces in there so I can keep track if the chat decides to freeze on me again. Yep, just checking. Seeing a fluffy research system is coming because I heard a woof. All right, then. It goes from... So this one to Uganda. Quebec. Yes. The Canadians finally get in the Crown Colony action. Now, she was laid down on the 20th of July, 1939. She was launched... August 1941, and commissioned January 1943. So she actually takes less than four years to build. She's transferred to the Royal Canadian Navy for use in 1944. You can tell when she's bought by them. In, 19, in March 1943, after training Sagabafo, Uganda is sailed as a convoy escort to protect Sierra Leone bound convoys from and the German Navic class destroyers operating out of the Bay of Biscay. After two such convoy duties, uh, she then goes sent as an escort for the ocean liner Kuhn Mary, which is carrying Winston Church and his staff to Washington. The journey was a whole journey was made at 30 knots. And the ship sailed into naval station uh, Argentia, Newfoundland, low on fuel. Unsurprisingly, after doing the entire trip on 30, at 30 knots. But let's go again. Let's start thinking about it. She does the whole trip across the Atlantic right at 30 knots. Let's do this. So that's roughly two thousand one hundred and eight, two thousand two hundred miles. She does at thirty knots. And what's her range going again? Yes, they're supposed to be able to do 10,000 nautical miles at 12 knots. So, yeah, doing that at 30 knots. Theoretically viable.
she goes from Liverpool to Newfoundland, so crosses the Atlantic at 30 knots. It's fun times. It really is. She then goes and takes part in Mediterranean operations after she's had a refit in Plymouth. And she's there for the bombardment uh, as part of Operations Husky, the invasion of Sicily. And do, 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 do. then, well, she's basically along with Uganda, Orion, her sister Mauritius, and the monitor Erebus supports the British 8th Army as they advance. And various Dutch gunboats as well, Commander Supporter. She takes part in Operation Avalanche. However, it's during Operation Avalanche that the Germans counterattack and create a serious uh, situation in the bridgehead, mainly by using um, their gun for their fire support. So Uganda comes in close to provide direct naval gun fire support. This then leads to Germans doing air attacks with FX 1400 radio controlled and HS 293 glider bombs. So on the 13th of September, she takes a direct hit from a Fritz X drop dry KG 100 bomber. So that's an FX 1400. The Fritz X managed to pass through seven decks and straight through her keel, exploding underwater, underwater just under the keel. The concussive shock of the Fritz-X underwater detonation managed to, damage, it, it managed to extinguish all her boiler fires and resulted in 60 men being killed and her taking on 1,300 tons of water. However, damage control under Lieutenant Leslie Reed managed to get the ship moving with one engine. She was towed to Malta by New SS uh, Narrow's Gazette, Narrow's Gazette, a Naharvo class fleet tug where temporary repairs were made, but there was no dry dock available in the European theater that could handle the repairs, so Uganda was sent to the USS shipyard at Charleston, South Carolina. So she, this heavily damaged ship crossed the Atlantic Ocean again with only one of her four propellers working, arriving at Charleston on the 27th of November, 1943. During the repairs, Uganda had two hangars designed for carrying submarine walls for aircraft aircraft removed, and the space was instead used for radio and radar equipment as well as crew amenities. It was while under repair that the Can government of Canada negotiated Britain to obtain Uganda for the Royal Canadian Navy. The official transfer took place on Trafalgar Day, 21st of October 1944, at Charleston, and she was renamed HMCS Uganda out of respect for the British colony and because, as I said, there were reasons to keep her called Uganda. She gets quite a notable crew. The commanding officer of the captain, uh, commanding officer of the crew was Captain Rollo Maginagai, OBE. Who uh, Rolo main guy OBE, who later becomes chief of naval staff. The first officer was Commander Hugh Pullen, and other officers included Lieutenant Commanders William Landymore, and another officer called Littler, who were all eventually promoted to flag rank following the war. And Lieutenant John Roberts, the aircraft recognition officer, went on to become the Premier of Ontario. The first crew for Uganda were drawn from every province in Canada, as well as the Dominion of Newfoundland. 87% were reservists, uh, while the balance were regular members of the Royal Canadian Navy. She was then tasked to join the British Pacific Fleet operational area south of San Gun Gunto in the Pacific. She joined the 4th Cruiser Squadron and spent the rest of the month working up. The conditions of the crew were arduous, since the ship had not been modified for tropical conditions which would have provided for better air circulation throughout the ship and more fresh water capacity. These things were all limited. She had got there by modification uh, via the United Kingdom, where she had some more modification, and uh, via stopping at Gibraltar, Alexandria, Egypt, Suez Canal, and Aden and Colombo and Ceylon on the way to Fremantle, Australia, and Pacific. 
As flagship of the RCN, Uganda served the Pacific War the British fleet from uh, basically till the end of the war. Assigned Task Force 7 and 57, British Pacific Fleet, because her radar and aircraft identification capabilities were amongst the best in the fleet, owing to her refit in Charleston. Mm, she took part in the strike against Sakes Gunto, but that was cancelled and they were ordered to attack Formosa instead. She goes on to take part in Operation of Laity Gulf with the United States Fur Fleet. And on the 4th of April 1945, the Canadian government changed the manning policy for all ships deploying to Pacific Theatre. All those heading to the Pacific were, would have to re-volunteer. Upon volunteering again, servicemen would be eligible for 30 days leave in Canada before deployment. This policy was a change was applied to those already there. And Uganda's RCN crew were polled by the Canadian government on 7th of May 1945 to determine whether they would volunteer for further duties in the Pacific War. Unfortunately, due to the poor living conditions and the lack of a Canadian identity for the ship and uh, the fact that, you know, issues were, they were quite a lot more well, hostilities only against Nazi Germany, and they now found themselves fighting Japan, 605 of her 907 crew refused to volunteer. The British Admiralty was understandably furious and said it could not replace the ship until 27th of July at the earliest. However, the cruiser continued its deployment in the Pacific throughout June and July while naval staff sought an answer to the problem. An embarrassed Royal Canadian Navy, Canadian Navy offered to replace Uganda with HMS, HMCS Prince Robert, an anti aircraft flagship that was being refitted in Vancouver. During this time, Uganda took part in Operation Inmate, the, the carry raid on Japanese installations in Truk. And then she was among the ship detailed to bombard the island of Dubum. In July, Uganda took part, uh, uh, was part of the Task Force 37, and sailed to join Americans performing carrier strikes on the Tokyo area and until she was eventually received, relieved by HMS Argonaut. That is a British Dido class cruiser. At this point, Uganda was detached from the US Navy's third fleet and proceeded to Entwok and then to uh, Eniwetok and then to Pearl Harbor before heading to Eskimot. En route to Pearl Harbor, one of her boilers suffered a liner collapse, which would result in the ship's withdrawal from activity combat at any rate, but, you know, in the nicest way, she's being withdrawn because the crew didn't want to be there. But she limps into Pearl Harbor on the 4th of August, but was not welcomed because of the resentment that her crew was quitting the war. And in fact, they had quite a bad experience in Pearl Harbor. Your commander then departed after refueling and proceeded to The crew on route to Canada, the crew heard news about the atomic bombs being dropped on Japan. They arrived on Eskimo on the 10th of August, the day that Japan announced the acceptance of the instrument of surrender. Anyway, the cruiser is paid off in August 1947 into RCN Reserve, and honestly, you, look, uh, you almost think the Canadian government want to leave it there. However, in 1951, the cruiser was refitted and modernized as well. The vessel was then recommissioned as HMCS Quebec, hoping that this would wipe away the shame of what had happened with Uganda at the end of World War II. Quebec then visits her namesake province, um, and Quebec and the aircraft became magnificent, participate in a major, uh, participated in the major NATO exercises after taking a turn in Korea. In February 1953, Quebec with Portugal and Huron, Portage and Huron, um, a minesweeper, and of course Huron's a tribal class destroyer, sailed to Bermuda for training with the Royal Navy submarine Andrew. And then in 1953, Quebec was the flagship for Rear Admiral Bidwell and led RNCN ships to the spit to Spithead for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. The Royal Canadian Navy at this point group consisting of an aircraft carrier, two cruisers, one destroyer, and two frigates. 1954, Quebec sailed on a seven-week training cruise to the Caribbean Sea in South America, making several port visits. As when the Korean War ends, Quebec was paid off in June 1956 and placed in reserve in Sydney, Nova Scotia. 
She was sold in 1960 and partly dismantled in Ontario. Uh, uh, partially dis um, dismantled ship, which had its stuff removed, was sent uh, from uh, was sent with the partly dismantled. Oh, sorry, my notes are terrible here. This is why you should never turn put handwritten notes and uh, get the computer auto transcribed them. The Ontario was also dismantled at the same time, and they were both sold to Mitsuo and Co. Japan for scrap. So they were broken up in Japan, which is rather appropriately considering they had not wanted to fight a war with the Japanese. And now I'll finish. I will answer the questions on Quebec before going on to Newfoundland. Fine. Comments. By the way, is the Adriatic Order still in effect? Hmm. Sure, Mac. Wow, did the RN make oil based armor as well? The RN made all sorts of things. Armor. It's amazing what you can use de and unflammable diesel fuel for. It is amazing what you can use. Basically, anything that's not that flammable, or they can use it theoretically, they will try and use. Holy praise the engineers. That is not something done without damn good reason. Why did she make the journey down the near flank? Uh, because they were escorting the Prime Minister, and the Queen Mary wasn't slowing down for them. Jeffiela. I read history of Uganda and the British, uh, the, and the British encouraged Canada not to rename her so as to keep our morale in Uganda, as if the Ugandan troops in Burma could not do that. Mm, that was part of the reason, but also, as I said, it wasn't full ownership really for a while. Shemak, then again, a lot of servicemen got the cold shoulder and pearl. Mm, yeah, but... Yeah, th there was basically the US Navy almost treated her as if she was a plague ship. Dirt Scott, wiping the name to wipe the shame. Now that's soldering. It's very old-fashioned soldering, definitely. Um, Jeff Hiller, if you gonna be named Canadian National Pride, might have kept her in service. Another example of British policy backfiring. <sighs> yes and no. Probably Newfoundland got the motor from Almirante to Captain. Eh, well, we'll get into Newfoundland and Peru now. And she is the last of our ships. And as you can see, she is firing her guns. And the photo is taken from HMS Rodney, I think. Yeah. Newfoundland was laid down on 9th of November 1939, launched 18, 19th of December 1941, and commissioned January 1943. After commissioning, Newfoundland joined the 10th Cruiser Squadron, home fleet. Early in 1943, the ship became flagship of the 15th Cruiser Squadron, Mediterranean. On the night of the 13th, 14th of July, 1943, during the Sicily campaign, she supported the 1st Parachute Brigade as they secured Primsol Bridge, which linked Cantania with Syria. In July 1943 and 23rd, uh, she was torpedoed by an Italian submarine, Asigari, uh, Asiga Asigari, Asigi, A S C I N G H I Asigi. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, some sources at the time tried to attribute this to U 407, but it was the Italian. One crewman was killed in attack, and her rudder was blown off. Temporary repairs were carried on Malta, and she was managing to steer using her propellers only, so that's basically by alternating power in the shafts. And with the assistance of some jury rig sails, this first mixed sail and steamship since the ironclad era managed to get to Boston Navy Yard for major repairs. 
1944, she's recommissioned to serve in the Far East. While Alexandria, uh, whilst Alexandria, uh, an exploding air vessel, compressed air is always fun, in one of the torpedoes in the port tubes, caused severe damage and one, another, uh, another time, one casualty. Fares delayed in her so arrival in the Far East for service to the British Pacific Fleet. And so she was sent to New Guinea when she arrived to support the Australian 6th Division in the Atape uh, Atape Wehwak campaign. Uh, Newfoundland took part in the attack of base on truck in the Caroline Islands during Operation Inmate. On the 6th of July 1945, Newfoundland left Maris in the Admiralty Islands other well, ships of the BPF to take part in the Allied campaign against the Japanese home islands. And she takes part in the bombardment of the city of the city of, Jum of Kamishi. And then she's part of the British Empire force, which takes control of the naval base at Yokosuka. The ship was president in Tokyo Bay when the instrument of surrender was assigned. And then she was uh, given the role of repatriating British Empire prisoners of war. Post-war, she's initially in part of the reserve, and then she uses a training ship as part of the Stokers training establishment and HMS in Paris. In Paris. Uh, then she, um, in 1951, she undergoes a 20-month reconstruction at Plymouth. Now, um, there are different uh, arguments about how extensive this modernization was. Some would argue it was the most... I would say it's roughly on a par with Belfast's. Uh, she's recommissioned on the 5th of November 1952. She becomes flagship of the 4th Cruiser Squadron in the East Indies. And then the cabinet of Sri Lanka managed to meet aboard her during the Hartel of 1953. Um, uh, country this was a sort of countrywide sort of period of demonstration, still the Spinants. And so the cabinet of Sri Lanka needed protection and security. So it was one of the Ceylon class, Ceylon subclass of the uh, Crown Colony class cruisers, which provided it. And then December 1953, Newfoundland underwent another a three month refit at Singapore and then was transferred to the Far East Station. Uh, uh, shelling the Malayan National Liberation Army targets near Penang on her passage to the Far East, just as you do. Oh, we've seen the Malayan National Army, Liberation Army. Boom, boom. In 1956, October, she, the Egyptian frigate Domiat was cruising south of the Suez Canal in the Rian Sea when you found the encountered her and ordered her to heave to. Aware of the tensions between Britain and Egypt that would lead to the Suez Crisis, Domiat refused and opened fire on the cruiser, causing some damage and casualties. Cruiser with the destroyer Diana then returned fire and sank her opponent before rescuing 69 cruise survivors from the wreckage. One man from Newfoundland was killed and five were wounded. Yeah. In other words, that's part of the naval one of the naval battles you never hear about. The sinking of the Domiat. Which was actually originally HMS Nif, a river class frigate. Mm -hmm. Newfoundland then returned to the Far East and was paid off the reserve in 1959. She sold to Peruvian Navy in November 1959, subsequently renamed Almirante Guru, uh, Grau, and then Captain Collins in 1973. Unfortunately, she is hulked in 1979 and uses a static training ship in Calo before being commissioned and, and scrapped in pretty much 1979, 1980. Hmm. And that is the last of the Crown Colony class. Cute shit.
Night Heron Production. Given, would it have been worth uh, worthwhile for the Iron to build more Edinburgh subclass tank cruisers than Crown Chronicles? Given the time frame for building the commissioning were about the same, and they offered more physical room for modernization. Yes. Hello, Night Heron Productions. Um, yeah, it would have been if they'd been. Uh, they, the government signed up though to eight thousand tons, and you couldn't pretend. It wasn't. So this is what they build instead. But it would have been interesting. It would certainly have been interesting. Right then, so when I summarize the class, I'm going to have this up here because I'm not going to really refer it, but I think it's worthwhile having up and I will expand it so people can read it uh, if they're watching this back on their phones. One, two, three, four, five. And now I'll just talk about the class. Dan Freeman, could you try renaming post-1936 Treaty Town class cruisers after small towns? HMS Dorchester? Uh, probably wouldn't have worked. My name is I keep forgetting about 8,000 ton agreement. Yes. 1936. Just fun. Uh, animal 365. Uh, I think most navies don't look too far forward when it comes to ship designs. Um, the Royal Navy actually tries to. In fact, if you look at the piece, uh, some of the ships they're building in the 1930s, you can see they're thinking, we're going to be upgrading these as things go on. This is why we're building space into them now. And it's, uh, you know, it's one of the things, you know, as Drac likes to point out with the town class cruisers, it's very quick, the Royal Navy, to manage to find all this armor that goes into the counties and covers the exact spots that need to be. And it doesn't affect the performance at all. And there is similar armor, I swear, added into various town class and crown colony class vessels. I honestly think the Royal Navy in the 1930s is designing, and they're designing everything viewed as going to be war in the 1940s. And the treaties are great for the 1930s, but they're not going to help in the war in the 1940s. So they are designing things with space to explain. It, it, as you say, that's not looking too far ahead, really. That's looking like a decade ahead. So that's not really looking a long way ahead. That's basically going, right then, we're going to need more space because we're going to need more light IA. We're going to need more this, more that. Um, Jeff look, Canada bought Uganda as flagship of the RCN. The official transfer took place the 21st of October 1944. She stayed Uganda out of respect for the British colony, even though she was the Canadian flagship. Uh, yes and no. How do I put this politely? Okay, so. Mm, there is kind of some, a lot of background dealings which goes on with HMS Uganda, so. It, it, yeah, I don't know. they buy her, but they, mm, how do I put this? Let's put this way, they're getting a very good deal on condition they don't change the name because of Uganda, and that the Royal Navy it has first refusal to have her back post-war if they decide they don't need her, and because it frees up quite a lot of British personnel to go and crew elsewhere. But in return, she's pretty much supposed to go wherever the British Navy needs her. So there are, it, it's an interesting thing, the whole Uganda case. So what makes the towns your favorite compared to this? Is it service record or is it size or Henderson? Well, I, these are Henderson's babies as well, let's be honest. They are ordered in, if I skip through, you know, they are ordered in 1938, 1939, they are designed in 1937-36. Henderson doesn't die till 1939. He's in charge well into the uh, well into this period. So these are his babies as much as the town class cruisers are.
Yeah, but look, so it's going to class only match torpedo itself. As I said, they did torpedo Sharnhorst. It just took a lot of torpedoes to sink Sharnhorst. Um, but honestly, the towns I prefer because of their size. I think they are a better balance. I think with their size, they are a better balance, and they managed to. I again, I have preferences in the towns. And honestly, I'd love to see the quadruple gunships. But they didn't come around. If the quadruple turret ships have been around, they've been good. Crown Colony class cruisers are good ships. They are a compromise on two grounds. When they're sort of building. A, there's the treaty. So they've got to be eight thousand they've got to be aiming and look like they're eight thousand tons. Which means they can't look as big as the town class. Which actually gives the Royal Navy an advantage, because the Royal Navy has already told the certain people that the town class are only 10,000 tons. And we all know that that's a very generous 10,000 tons. So... You can... Uh, you, you are having a you're going, look, it's obviously smaller than the town class. It must be 8,000 tons, sort of thing going on. But I would say, right. And one of the good things of having this up here is it has a list of the roles, and it goes: there's the battle cruiser, armored cruiser, protected cruiser, auxiliary cruiser, scout cruiser. You know, different roles. So if we call battle cruisers battle cruisers and just leave them there, and we say county cruiser, uh, county class are your First class, your armored cruisers. They're your new armored cruisers. So then the light cruisers come in, and I would say they are equipped with mostly the protected cruisers in my mind. And I would say town class are your first class protected cruisers. And I would say the trouble is the Crown Colonies fit somewhere between the second and first class. Protected cruisers, really. Because if they'd been built to the full measure of the towns, they'd be unequivocally the first class. But because, especially if they lose their third tur uh, fourth turret and all these things, they go down to nine guns. They sort of end up flirting with the more Leander area second class protected cruiser. Definitely nowhere near the Arafusa third class protected cruiser, but you know, they're, they're sort of around there. That's true. RN, being Del Boy since the 1600s, to an extent. That's good. They were 10,000 tons, but sat oddly high in the water, like they were designed to have, say, yet another 1,500 tons of displacement somewhere. Hmm. Admiral, uh, Animal 616365. Uh, Sounds like what the Japanese did with Mon free Mongami class. They were supposedly 8,500 ton ships. Mm hmm. That's Aaron explaining how their ships managed to weigh in at 10,000 tons. 8,000 tons. We used balsa wood for internal, all internal fittings. That is an armor. It's in tin foil. And yeah. Jeff Hill. Were torpedoes removed post war? Yes. Honestly, <sighs> torpedoes were useful when they were likely to run across other cruisers. And if you think post World War II, which navies have cr other cruisers on enemy battleships? Which navies have cruisers and battleships? Post World War II. They're all allies. And the French Navy, the Dutch Navy, the American Navy. What does the Soviet Navy have? Nothing immediately post World War II. So you don't need torpedoes. And torpedoes are a risk as the compressed air going off, you know, the showed. They are a risk. So the Crown Colonies are an attempt to get an acceptable variant of the town for eight thousand for roughly eight thousand tons.
Because really, what the RM wanted was another 12 towns. Well, Gretchen, to be fair, the Magami class weigh a lot less when you realise they aren't armed with any main guns, they just carry the Yamato secondary battery around. Hmm. That's Scott, we met the treaty debt obligations by filling all the void spaces with hydrogen. Dear guys, Sveldovs, Jeff Bieler Sveldovs. Sveldovs don't come into service until well after World War II, okay? I know, because I've written an entire paper which is on global maritime history on them. And as beautiful as the Sverdov cars are, they are built 1949 to 1955. They're commissioned 1952 to 2000. There is a lot of time between them being laid down in 1945, launched in 1950, and World War II for the Royal Navy to get rid of torpedoes and justify it on, based on saving money and risk, because politicians are demanding it saves money and gets rid of cr and reduces crews. Now initially, the Royal Navy tries to use the Sveldov class to justify keeping as many crews as it could in service and HMS Vanguard in service. And unfortunately, the politicians don't really support it. Some of it's had light cruisers. They are not really light cruisers by any chance that the Royal Navy's worried about. Don't take this the wrong way, but the Royal Navy saw what the Russians did with the ships they, they loaned them. Bud guy eight eight two nine. When did anti-submarine warfare torpedoes get mounted on warships? Ah, you're dealing with about the nineteen seventies. They start coming in. Yes, there is a lovely thing. Again, you have to remember World War Two ends, and we are still technically allies with the Soviet Union, and there is a Labour government in power in Britain who do not want another war, who want to start building a land fit for heroes again. And then you have a conservative government under, under Churchill come in, and they're having to deal with all sorts of things. They want to save money. So they're going to get rid of the things which are the risks. So you can argue that this doesn't exist, that this reason isn't there. But that's the reason they give. And that's the reason they use. There aren't enough threats. There aren't enough cruisers. There aren't enough things out there which justify the cruisers retaining torpedoes. Eric Hagen, Svodols were huge. Hmm. And my 16.36.5. How many towns did the RN want? In their dreams, they'd have had about 24. Jeff Hiller, did the towns keep their torpedoes? Some of them did. They were some of the last to lose them. Belfast, I think, was the last loser to torpedoes. From memory. I'm sure someone will go to free Norman Freeman now find, no, 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 one ship still maintained torpedoes longer than Belfast, but I think it was Belfast. No, the RN wanted 24 town class cruisers, uh, town class cruisers. Um, that would have certainly been an interesting thing for World War, uh, for if World War II had happened on their timescale and they'd had the permission to build the ship they wanted. <sighs> there is a reason they want 24. As the Shaw said, that's all towns. Remember a. Cruiser squadron is four ships. The RN planned to have two squadrons of towns based in the home fleet, two squadrons of towns based in the Mediterranean, and one squadron of towns based in the East Indies, and one squadron of towns based in the Far East. 
So they wanted six squadrons of talents because they wanted to be able to then use their heavy cruisers when they started replacing the counties uh, for other deployments. Dan Freeman, one moment to have a dream about the RN managing to have their 70 cruisers with RF users, town class, and county class. It would have been an interesting scenario. Death Squad, I wonder what today's RN vessels are going to give for 24, 11, and a half thousand ton vessels today. Um, a very, very happy day. Jeff Hiller, post war can living, well, living conditions improve into the colonies? Um, only they were they improved post war living conditions by uh, unmanning the crew the B and Y turrets crews. So basically, they took off two turrets worth of personnel to make them easier to live and safe and a bit more spacious to live in and better better places. But the idea was that in a wartime they would quickly surge the crew. So their living conditions weren't really improved. They were just made fine until we have another war. <laughs> Gia Guy AR001, they would have to be manned. Uh, if you're talking about a modern 11,500 ton vessel, you're probably consider the Zumwalt class and what the Royal Navy do equipment want. They could probably man 24 of them. Well, they could definitely man 18, 19 of them. And they could probably find the crew for the rest of them. Sorry, crude. I'm still learning. Actually, for some reason, I always assume the cruisers exit on the... Hmm. This one. I can see the iron trying to sell off the RAF for that. No. Not the whole RAF. The county seemed to offer an operate as lone wolves. Well, yes. And that was quite often what they were used for, and the towns were used for that as well in peacetime. In wartime, that is what a, count, a county can do. An 8-inch gun cruiser, if it runs up against a surface raider, which has, well, even if it has 11-inch guns, is going to go, you know what, I'd rather not be here if I'm a full county. Uh, you're a full county class, yes. You've got 8, and you can go full speed. I, you're not HMS Exeter. I'm, I'm going to be elsewhere. Not him, Larry Lonesome. Hmm. That's sure. For some reason, I always assumed that crews existed on their own own. Uh, they tended to work in part of groups. Quite often, they worked as part of groups. And you have to remember, a squadron's assigned to an area, and so then you have four ships assigned to that area. And one might be in refit, and one might be tooling around as the squadron flagship, and a couple of couple will be wandering around solo. So you'd assign four to the Far East, and they would be going around doing their various things. And you'd assign four to the West Indies, they go around doing. You'd have eight in the Mediterranean. That's really your surge group. They can go back either way, depending on them. And your eight in the home fleet, well, they're going to be your ships which are in deep maintenance, long to, uh, uh, in major maintenance refit, and the ships which are wandering around doing the home fleet duties. Basically, the Eurofighters. The Iron would happily sell off the Eurofighters, probably, at that point. Joking. They wouldn't. They could come for use for the Eurofighters. Ah, uh, no. Cruisers, and especially the RN, like to use cruisers in a pack to go hunting for surface raiders. That's what happens at the River Plate. The whole reason the River Plate happens, the Germans go, Yay, we've got a surface raider down here! It can take on any single one of the Royal Navy crews in this area! And the Royal Navy goes, yeah, you think we're going to turn up with just one? There's a reason we wanted 70 of them. Hello! Meet my friends! I'm Ajax! This is Achilles! That's Exeter! We've come to party! And Grassface going, There are other places I want to be right now. So they patrol on their own, but they could form, a, and especially in peacetime, they'd be doing their presence missions on their own. But in wartime, they might well be formed into a hunter killer group. Okay, what do we have coming up? Uh, we have. Well, as I said, Operation Claymore tomorrow. Uh, Brew Ships 40. Books used when writing. 
uh, Lend Least Act on the 11th of March next uh, next week. That's next Thursday's one. 80 years to the day of it being signed, so we're going to go through the Lend Least Act. 14th of March, uh, History of Armour and Amphibious Warfare. As it, it was suggested by Carl Harmon originally for a live, I've decided to turn it into a brew ships, mainly because I can, uh, but also because I have an idea of how to do it. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, Dan Scott, I now have visions of the RN um, trying to strap lots of rockets onto a sled to launch Eurofighter off the tire. No, 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 no. Quite simple. Eurofighters have a very distinct role protection of the home base. That's good. That allows the Royal Navy to free up to go hunting. <sighs> That's all the whole thing is. In, in... There is always this phrase that comes up in history, a good, a, a be, the best defense is a good offense. It's a lovely phrase, and it's absolutely twaddle in, some, in many, many respects. Because whilst it's true, if you are attacking the enemy, they, can't, they theoretically can't attack you, they often will. And it's very hard to mount and secure a good offense if you don't have a strong defense, i.e. if you do not have secure lines of communication and secure base of supply. That's a core part of a good offense, is to have a secure line of communication and a secure base of supply. So you cannot, so the idea that a best form of def, uh, defense is a good offense is great, but you can't actually do a good offense without a good defense. Animal, uh, animal, uh, animal 163365, uh, nice stream, I'm going to have to watch more to keep, well, I mean, thank you. It's always nice to have more people coming along. I might just start calling you Animal or 16, uh, 16365, but you know, that, that's just me being, well, basically shortening the pronunciation. As always, I offer my humble access to age, dreadnought, procurement, and material in Hungarian, in Hungarian. Ooh, well, that could be coming up. As said, that is Bailenora's suggestion uh, for the second year of powers on 18th of March, and that will get a lovely stuff done on 18th of March. And then on 21st of March, we have Rusius 42, some more sci fi. Lines of Taurus Vedras for anyone? <laughs> yes, exactly, Alistair Shaw, the Lines of Taurus Vedras. Thank you, Animal. animal. That's kind of, thank you, that's nice. Wow, that, that's okay. It's a, as I said, keep, sometimes some names, it's like Aviator Enterprise. I'm not sure if they're in today, but it's sort of, it's Aviator 1701, and that just, Seems to take longer to pronounce than Aviator Enterprise. And there's also the Sino Japanese War of 1894, Naval and Loud Operations. And I should announce that. Da -da 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 -da. Where is it? It's come, it's arrived. Not that one. That one there is. This book has arrived, uh, Capretto uh, and the Isonzo campaign. I'm going to be reviewing it on Sunday in Brew Ships as requested, because it was requested for a good book on the Italian front. And it's by John MacDonald and Zelcho Simbrek, and it is pretty darn good. But I'll give you more details of that on Sunday's Brew Ships. Jesse, being like, in retrospect, the UK should have fast tracked replacing tornadoes with Eurofighters and kept the Harriers. Probably. In remembrance, I like the shorthand title. Thank you. Discord, Lenly Sack. Warm materials like chewing gum. Once it's used, you don't tend to want it back. Mm, which is why the British end up chucking a load of aircraft into the sea. If you go out to various spots in the world, you can find whole piles of aircraft from World War II sitting on the bottom of the ocean. Right. Crazy Loka, just don't call me late for pizza. <laughs> oh, right. So, this is what we've got coming up. Um, I hope you've enjoyed. Right then, before I go, any questions? So, as I said, I'm going to be going soon to help the family pack up and get to bed and possibly walk the fluffy research assistant again.
he's only had, they've only had two or three or two walks a day you know that's uh, that, that they, they complain about this one they would like uh, especially the large fluffy research assistant would like to spend all day walking <laughs> Oh, let's do that. Oh, you can see more of the t-shirt. By the way, this t-shirt comes from the Imperial War Museum. Um, and they're nice. They are nice. If you like them, go track down the IWM. Take care, John Shea. Hello, thank you. Uh, Vision, 1975 novel, HMS Hero, was pretty good with a Soviet sub trapped in Scottish lock. But like Star Trek episode in conclusion. Ooh. Hmm. Might work for it. That's all. No fun. Hello, thank you. Take care. That's good. It's a quote from a U.S. Republican senator. He was he also opposed to the act. Just calling, uh, just calling giving tanks and stuff to anyone willing to fight the Germans what it was. Yeah, it was. So, uh, Amok, Great War Channel covered the Italian front in depth. FYI. Thank you. Oh, I, no, it did, but I was, as I said, I was asked specifically to find a good book on it, and so I've been hunting one. Animal 1635, uh, Animal, uh, well, keep up the live streams because I get bored driving my 18 wheeler or lorry in your country. Well, that is fun, and don't worry, we, I do keep it live streams. Live streams are every Thursday and Sunday, and there are recorded videos which start, which come out 10 to on a Tuesday. They're the long patrols. And they usually are a set of 40 minute videos which are just queued up. Um. Take care, DGB40. Thank you, Bishon. Take care, Dan Freeman. Thank you. They're now more Leander class in opinion rather than Dido class. I'm glad. The Crown Colonies are cool, as I said, but they are, they do sort of st start off as town class, uh, small, uh, slightly reduced town class, and end up more like being expanded Leanders. Crazy Locker. Nice thing about owning a free acre farm dog gets plenty of walking. That is useful. Production. Want to ask a question, but can't think of a good one. Take care. Have a nice evening. Masada Slavic. Thanks and have a good night. Pleasure. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Oof. Good night, Dr. Clark. A good night, Dan Freeman. A good night, everyone. Ooh, I, it's so tempting to try and see uh, see how long this will go. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. That's that's a lot longer off it, so no. And. Thank you, Eric Ocken. Take care. Thank you, Howard Maxi and Clazy Guka. Thank you, everyone, for watching. As always, if you do like the videos, please like, maybe subscribe. Um, possibly press the little bell down there. That gives you an update when it has. And please consider joining Discord. Come and have, join the chat that goes on, or and if you feel like being very generous and helping with my extortionate book habit, join Patreon. Thank you. Where and, and by the way, as part of Patreon, you do get to suggest topics, and then the six or seven of the suggested topics which I like the most and think I can do justice to go to a vote, and then the top two of those get done the next month. So that's how my Patreon works. And you also get access to all the slides when I remember to upload them. I do tell me I sometimes forget. Right. Take care, Greg. Sarsky. Take care, Carmel Gasberg. Dan Freeman. Good night, everyone. Blessings to the Blackburn. Blackburn be upon you all. Okay. Take care, Jeff Beeler. Wool of Towns. Oh, I like that. I might have to borrow that for a book at some point. Thank you, Joshy Pizzas. And thank you, Anuk. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you.